Good morning and welcome to the externally led patient focused drug development meeting on food allergies. My name is Lisa Gable and I'm the chief executive officer at FAIR. I am also a co-founder of the Food Allergy Collaborative along with End Allergies Together, Allergy Strong, and Genentech. The collaborative launched in 2019 as an alliance to advance effective patient-centered initiatives in food allergy awareness, research, therapies, and care. The collaborative includes FAIR, Al Allergy and Asthma Foundation of America, Allergy and Asthma Network, Allergy Strong, FACT, Food Equality Initiative, Food Allergy Fund, Elijah Alavi Foundation, and Kimberly Desai. All have played a critical role towards this meeting today, and I thank them for their dedication and commitment to this process. Nimble partnerships like the Food Allergy Collaborative and our work with the FDA to elevate the patient's voice are critical to accelerating research, development, and the approval of therapeutic products that meet the needs of our community. Elevating the voices of those with food allergies has always been part of our work and has helped push our collective advocacy goals forward. These efforts are critical as food allergies are life-threatening and can wreak havoc physically, emotionally, and economically for 32 million Americans. We firmly believe that innovative approaches informed by patients and caregivers are critically needed. And as such, we are encouraged to see that our colleagues at the FDA have made food allergies a priority. As you will hear today, the diagnosis process for food allergy can be challenging for families. The primary strategy for managing food allergy is allergen avoidance, which is complex, anxiety producing, and sometimes unattainable. Avoidance can be especially difficult for those who experience food insecurity. There is only one approved therapy to reduce the severity of food allergy reactions, and it's peanut-specific, and its approval is currently limited to children and teenagers. Today, you will hear the need for more innovative approaches in research and the regulatory process to bring more food allergy solutions into market that address the patient needs. The food allergy therapeutic pipeline is diverse and includes novel agents such as food-derived proteins placed on the skin and under the tongue, injections, probiotics, immune-modified antibodies, and vaccines. Furthermore, patient-centered innovative approaches are required to build upon our success. We have various attendees today, both in person and virtually, including those with food allergy and their caregivers, FDA, industry, and clinicians. But first and foremost, we want to thank the patients and the caregivers here today, both in person and virtually, for sharing their lived experience with food allergy. Their stories are invaluable to this process. We'd also like to thank the FDA for supporting us in holding this meeting and attending today. And we'd also like to thank our generous supporters, DBV Technologies, Immune, Novartis, Genentech, who financially sponsored this meeting. You'll hear today about the reality of daily living with food allergies. For those participating remotely, we invite you to call in or write in during the program. We want to hear from as many perspectives as possible. Your stories are so critically important. We're delighted to hear from Dr. Ronald Rabin about the patient-focused drug development program at the FDA and how our voices today will aid the agency in the regulatory decision-making process. Dr. Rabin is the chief of the Laboratory of Immunobiochemistry in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the FDA. So next, we'll hear from Dr. Rabin. Uh, well, I want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak uh, to you today uh, about uh, patient-focused drug development. Uh, before I start on that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Food and Drug Administration. Of course, you know what we do. We regulate uh, foods, drugs, and biologics uh, to ensure that they're safe and effective 
uh, to be uh, marketed and licensed in the United States. Um, here in the, uh, the, the Food Drug Administration is organized into various centers, all of which are uh, under the umbrella of the Office of the Commissioner. Uh, and um, the, the two centers that uh, are of most interest to you are the Center for Food Safety uh, and uh, Applied Nutrition, uh, which deals with um, the contents of foods, and then the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, in which we deal with anything that is a biologic that is used to treat, mitigate, or diagnose disease. And so, you know, as you well know, uh, when uh, a uh, food is used uh, to treat uh, food allergy, uh, it is not considered a food as such by the law, but it's considered a biologic and regulated by us. Uh, the center is uh, <clears throat> divided, subdivided into various offices. I'm in the Office of Vaccine Research uh, and Review. And within that is the division of uh, parasitic, uh, biologic parasitic and allergenic products of which I am the head of one of the labs in DBPAP. Uh, our mission is to protect and promote public health by evaluating the safety and effectiveness of new therapies. And while we play a critical oversight role in drug development, it's just one part of the process. It's important for you to understand that we do not develop drugs or conduct clinical trials. Instead, we provide regulatory oversight during drug development and make decisions regarding marketing approval for new drugs and biologics. And we provide guidance to regulated industry on clinical, scientific, and regulatory matters. Now, what is PFDD? Patient-focused drug development is a systematic approach to ensure that patients' experiences, perspectives, needs, and priorities are captured and meaningfully incorporated into drug development and education. Now, how did it begin? Well, it's a 30-year journey that began during the AIDS crisis. Um, during the AIDS crisis, FDA uh, engaged with patients and to, because they wished, understandably, to be actively involved in the uh, study and, and clinical studies and, and to have a voice in how the drugs to treat their affliction were regulated. Um, and this was expanded then from HIV to oncology and then branched out as we began to appreciate the value of input from patients towards considering the benefit risk profiles of potential therapeutics. And the engagement within patients in PFDD continues to evolve, and it became more methodological as it was included in the 2012 Prescription Drug Users Fee Act, which is the law that regulates, that, that defines how we interact with sponsors as they bring new drugs to us uh, for uh, clinical studies and ultimately uh, licensure. PFDD integrates patient input into drug development using a life cycle approach. At the translational phase, we identify and measure outcomes and burdens that matter most to patients. During in the clinical study phase, we want to develop, we want to be sure that the best possible clinical studies are designed that can recruit and that those studies can recruit and retain study participants. At the pre-market review, we want to integrate the patient reported outcomes and patient preference information into benefit risk assessments. And then post-market, we want to communicate with patients and providers to facilitate making informed decisions. So we really want to begin building the patient's perspective in at the translational phase. And it's important to understand that the benefit risk assessment is calibrated according to disease severity. So the benefit risk assessment would be very different for you know, uh, advanced cancer, for example, than it would for allergic rhinitis. So what have we learned? We've learned that patients are experts in what it's like to live with their condition. Patients can articulate how disease impacts their lives with regard to symptoms, 
psychological impact and quality of life. And you can identify and articulate how you want treatments to benefit you. Uh, a cure to eat foods ad lib, a relief of anxiety, a fear of accidental exposure so that you can be with your friends or your children can eat lunch at school with their friends. We've also learned that patients wanna be active towards developing and evaluating new treatments. Patient want, patients want FDA to communicate the most effective pathway that you can contribute towards evaluating therapeutics. And you want understand though, that FDA may not be able to address all the gaps in a current treatment to drug development with any single product. Externally led PFDD meetings are a pathway for patients to contribute to, to drug development. Patient organizations identify and organize these patient-focused collaborations to generate public input on scientific disease areas, such as food allergy. PFDD meetings provide an important opportunity for us to hear directly from you, your advocates, and caregivers about the, how your disease impacts your lives and which benefits of a potential treatment are most important to you. It's important that you understand that while FDA is open to participating in a well-designed and well-conducted meeting, an externally led PFDD meeting and any resulting outcomes such as surveys or reports are not considered FDA sponsored or FDA endorsed. What these meetings do though, however, is they strengthen understanding of the disease and the treatment burden. So these meetings can support us by informing us to the therapeutic context towards conducting benefit risk assessments for products under review and advising drug sponsors on their development programs. The patient input may also support drug development more broadly, such as identifying areas of unmet needs or identifying or developing tools to measure benefits or raising awareness and channel engagement within your own community. The meeting summary reports that capture your experience and desired impacts can be shared on the FDA website. And so if you have any questions, please contact us by uh, visiting our webpage or emailing us at uh, the address below. Again, I wanna thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you about PFDD. And now back to the meeting. Well, we greatly appreciate Dr. Rabin for setting the stage for today's discussion. I really think it helped bring clarity to all the impact that you all are having by being here and being online. I'd like to now introduce Linda Herbert, PhD assistant professor in the Division of Psychology and Behavioral Health, Children's National Hospital. She will be providing a brief clinical overview on food allergy. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm Linda Herbert. I'm a psychologist and assistant professor at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC, where I work with the Division of Allergy and Immunology doing clinical work and uh, psychosocial research. Today, we're gonna talk about the background regarding food allergy to give you a really nice introduction to today's talk. And just so you know, I have no disclosures to report. So let's start by talking about the prevalence and some demographic information about food allergy. We know based on some epidemiological studies that about 8% of children in the United States and about 11% of adults in the United States are diagnosed with food allergy. We also know that this can be di diagnosed during infancy, as soon as a child has their first food, all the way up through adulthood. There are many foods that you can be allergic to, but the most common ones include peanut, tree nut, cow's milk, egg, wheat, soy, shellfish, fish, and sesame. And we know that many individuals who are diagnosed with food allergy are not diagnosed only with food allergy. There's also many comorbid conditions such as atopic dermatitis, 
and asthma and environmental allergies. So when we're working with patients that have food allergies and their families, we need to remember that they're also managing many other things as well. We also see a growing trend of data that is indicating that there is a disproportionate impact of food allergy on specific individuals in the United States. We know that Black and Hispanic Latinx children are disproportionately affected being diagnosed with allergies more frequently than white counterparts. And we know that Asian and Black children have higher rates of having more than one food allergy than white children. We also know that families that have lower income tend to spend more on emergency care than families with higher income. And it's my hope that today, as you're talking about um, all of the, the needs in food allergy, that you're really keeping this in mind so that we can ensure that our discussions um, take advantage of finding ways to be equitable and to give access to treatments and diagnostics for all patients. Food allergy is an adverse health effect that arises from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. Allergic reactions can involve many systems, including skin and mucous membranes, the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory system, and the cardiovascular system. And when many systems are involved, this allergic reaction is called anaphylaxis. And this is a very severe allergic reaction that can have very serious consequences, including shock and potentially death. In order to illustrate for you a little bit more about the diagnostic process, the treatment process, and the psychosocial aspects of food allergy, I'm going to present to you a, a case that is a composite of many of the patients that I've worked with over the last decade. Mary is the mother of Jaden, an 18-month-old boy who experienced hives when he was first eating scrambled eggs. His pediatrician conducted testing that was positive to peanut and cow's milk and egg and referred him to an allergist. And while waiting for this appointment, Mary decided to pause new food introduction because she was uncertain about what was safe for her son to eat. So let's look a little bit at what this journey is looking like for them. First is diagnosis. And what's likely to happen at the allergist appointment is that first Mary will be asked to give a detailed food history of all of the foods that her son has been eating and if he's had any symptoms after ingestion that are reproducible. Based on that history, the allergist will then likely recommend skin prick tests, which is allowing us to look at very specific allergens via um, looking at the sensitivity of the skin to that allergen extract. From there, the allergist is also likely to recommend specific blood tests to look at IgE antibodies for specific foods. And all of this can take time, it can take some weeks, and Mary might be feeling a bit uncertain about what it is that she can feed her child. Um, but together, this is what the allergist will use to make a recommendation about what foods are okay for Jaden to eat. The allergist may also recommend what's called an oral food challenge, which is the gold standard in food allergy diagnosis right now. This is a procedure where kids um, and adults who um, might be able to tolerate a food have a stepwise ingestion of the allergen to determine the outcome. And if they're able to tolerate this food during the food challenge, they're then able to go home and introduce that food into their diet. After this diagnostic process, Mary's allergist would be telling her what it is that needs to happen to manage um, her son's food allergy. And right now, the primary form of food allergy management is an elimination diet, which requires Mary to completely eliminate all the allergens from her son's diet in order to keep him safe and avoid allergic reaction. So she's going to have to start learning how to read food labels, how to advocate for her son and communicate to others about the need to avoid certain allergens. She's going to have to learn about cross contact, which is when um, a food that is not an allergen um, might be touched by a food that it is an allergen, which then contaminates it, it makes it unsafe. And she's going to have to learn how to educate schools and daycare providers, all of these people in order to keep her child safe. Right now, there is one other treatment option for children that have peanut allergy, and that is FDA approved um, as of 2020, and it's called Palforzia. It's an oral immunotherapy. So it's possible that at some point, um, Jaden's allergist would speak with Mary about this as an option. When it comes to treatment for allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, 
Right now, epinephrine um, administered intramuscularly is the treatment that needs to occur. So families have to have a prescription for an auto injector and they need to carry that with them. So in addition to learning how to avoid allergens and to communicate with others about allergen avoidance, Mary also needs to be learning how it is that she can educate others on the treatment of anaphylaxis and she needs to ensure that she has medication available. The course of food allergy can really vary child by child and food by food. Sometimes they resolve, sometimes they don't. Many patients have lifelong food allergies and diagnoses can really evolve over time. And this is what can really complicate food allergy management for families because they're constantly having to be flexible and to adapt. This is also where some of our health equity concerns come up because if kids do not have access to regular allergy care, they might not be learning that they have changes to their food allergy diagnoses and that can definitely impact um, their quality of life. So this is just a timeline of what might have happened for Jaden. He reacts at age six months to egg. At 10 months, he receives official diagnoses. At 14 months, there may be a questionable reaction to another food. Perhaps he's allergic to soy and the allergist recommends an oral food challenge where that is confirmed. Things might be going along fairly smoothly for the family, but then there may be an allergic reaction that happens, which requires them to loop back with the allergist to consider whether or not they need to change anything about their doing. Um, based on blood work at age four, perhaps Jaden is then referred for an oral food challenge for baked milk. He may then tolerate it at a food challenge and then be on a protocol to introduce that into his diet. He may then have a direct milk challenge and be able to introduce direct milk as well. And this can continue along with him having occasional allergic reactions and occasionally being allergic to additional foods. So all of this, this, uh, this uncertainty, this impact of having to manage this daily, if you think about it, we eat three times a day at least, hopefully, and have snacks. Like there's a lot that families have to manage. So psychosocial research is indicating to us that affected children and parents and affected adults with food allergy as well are reporting increased stress related to daily burden. All of that extra time and planning, it takes a toll on families. And even families who do not experience a lot of anxiety are um, reporting that this is very stressful. When it comes to anxiety, we know that some anxiety about food allergy can be adaptive. We want families to be vigilant in order to keep their children safe and to keep themselves safe, but we don't want them to be so vigilant that they're not able to engage in all of the things that is wonderful about life, things like going out to eat, having holiday dinners, being able to interact with others and feel safe while doing that. Um, so there's anxieties that can come up that then can reduce families' confidence and participation. We hear fear about allergen exposure, about what will happen if they're exposed, about their ability to treat reactions. These are things that are on parents' minds and kids' minds. We hear fears and anxiety about trusting other caregivers to keep children safe. We hear concerns about relationships. Well, what's going to happen if I tell someone and advocate for my child? And we also hear a lot of fears about the future, which I call catastrophizing when we're thinking about what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now. Can my child go to college? Can I get a new job? Things like that. Can I date someone safely and tell them about my allergy? And all of this leads to sometimes a decreased quality of life, especially in these domains of social activities and diet diversity. So as we think about next steps, the things that I really want you all to take home is that we need to address uncertainty, we need to address access, and we need to address flexibility and choices across diagnosis um, and diagnostic tools, allergic reaction prevention, and allergic reaction treatment. So with diagnosis, we really need better tools that give families more certainty about what um, foods their child is allergic to. And we also need to have more options when it comes to prevention of allergic reactions. We're very fortunate to have the FDA approval of Palforzia, but some families might not be interested in oral immunotherapy or able to do that. And so we need to be considering other things like epicutaneous immunotherapy, which is currently working its way through the FDA and sublingual immunotherapy as well. And we need to be able to do this beyond peanut allergy. We also need to consider whether or not there are other ways to manage allergic reactions. Many individuals are scared of needles. So if there's other vehicles to administer epinephrine, this might be ideal. 
And then across all of this, I just want to hammer home this idea that we should be committing to address health equity concerns, um, keeping in mind that we want options that are realistic, accessible to all patients, and that are addressing the desired patient outcomes. We need to be listening to patients and trying to achieve what they're asking us to help them with. And then finally, I'd be remiss as a psychologist if I didn't also advocate for evidence-based interventions that can be implemented in, the, in our clinics to address the mental health aspects of all of this. So thank you so much. I'm honored to be able to give you this brief overview of food allergy. I'm sure you're gonna have a wonderful, robust discussion. I look forward to hearing it and back to the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. Um, I'd now like to welcome our moderator for today's meeting, James Valentine, who we've gotten to know over the last several months as he's helped us plan this meeting. James has worked the last 13 years as a champion for the patient voice. James previously worked at the FDA where he was a patient liaison helping to incorporate the patient voice into medical product review. There, he helped to develop and launch the patient-focused drug development initiative. In private practice, James has worked with many patient organizations to ensure their community's voices were heard by decision makers. Relevant to today's meeting, James has been involved in helping plan and moderating three-fourths of the 50 externally-led PFDD meetings. So we are in great hands with James. He actually knows what he's doing, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the stage, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lisa, and uh, those uh, following these great presentations. Uh, I don't think I could have said it better myself how important it is for us to uh, set our, our goals and expectations around what is important to all of you, which is really what today is all about. So now that we've heard that clinical overview from a disease expert, we're going to turn to the core of today's meeting, which is, is to hear from all of you, individuals living with food allergies and their direct caregivers, care partners, about the experiences of those who do live with food allergies. As we heard, patient-focused drug development is a systematic approach to gathering patient perspectives on their condition and on available treatments. As you heard from FDA's Dr. Ronald Robin, uh, your input can help inform the agency's understanding of food allergies to inform drug development and review. While FDA has held many of its own meetings, uh, today actually marks that 50th externally-led patient-focused drug development meeting. And with, met over, uh, with many thousands of known conditions, this is truly a unique and important opportunity for this community. I want to talk a little bit about today's meeting, which is interactive, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we'll be asking of all of you, both that are here in the room as well as on live over the web. So first, the meeting is organized into two overarching topics. First, in the morning, we're going to be exploring with you, individuals with food allergies and caregivers, what it is to experience living with food allergies and the impacts that living with food allergies has on your daily life. We're then going to come back together in the afternoon, our second session, where we're going to explore the various different treatment approaches that you have uh, for living with uh, and making life easier living with food allergies. We'll also, during that session, ask you for your preferences around future treatments. We heard a little bit about that in the presentation, but we want to hear from you, you know, what you're looking for uh, from future treatments, what your treatment goals are for you or your loved one. So those two sessions that we're going to have, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what they're going to look like. We really have three overarching ways we're going to be hearing from all of you. First, for each of our two sessions, we're going to start it off hearing from a panel of individuals living with food allergies and their caregivers. These panels will help set a good foundation for the discussion. They are selected to reflect a range of experiences of people who live with food allergies and, and caregivers. Uh, however, we know that uh, no panel uh, of, of individuals can reflect the full experience of what it is to live with food allergies. And that's why they're going to just be serving as the foundation of what will be a broader than audience discussion. So during that audience discussion, we're going to be asking all of you that are here in the room, individuals with food allergies and their caregivers, 
as well as all of you that are following along online, online to help build on what we've heard from the panel. I'll be posing questions to the audience, to all of you, and I'll be inviting you to uh, comment on those questions. If you're here in the room, uh, this will be a little simpler. We'll just ask for you to raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Just please state your name uh, and then uh, answer the question, and we'll have a little bit of a conversation, you and me, here in the room to understand your experiences. Uh, we do ask that you please wait for the microphone. Uh, that way, all of our guests that are online will be able to have the advantage of hearing uh, the conversation and the dialogue in the room. For those of you that are online, we want to hear your voices too. We'll be inviting you to dial in by phone. Uh, we'll be repeating this throughout the program, but if you want to take note now, that phone number is 1-703-844-3231. Again, that's 1-703-844-3231. You can call in early and often throughout the program uh, to share your responses to those discussion questions. Alternatively, there's also a written comment uh, box that is under the live stream for today. So if you're following along uh, online, uh, you can also supplement any phone calls that you might make by writing in, and we'll be sharing some of those uh, written comments throughout the session as well. And then finally, the third way we're gonna ask you all to participate is through polling questions. So these are for our patients and our caregivers only. Uh, for uh, those of you in the room, it's probably easiest to use your cell phone and open up a browser to do that. If you're following along online, you certainly can also do it uh, on, a, on the computer that you're using and a new tab in your browser. Um, you can actually go ahead and get into that system now because we're gonna be staying in that throughout the day. So if you open up your phone, open up that tab, uh, or again, if you're on a computer, you can open up a tab in, in your browser and go to www.pullev.com forward slash food allergy. That should be displayed for everybody both in the room and online. Again, you can go ahead and get into the system, and we'll be getting to some of these polling questions very soon. These questions, we're gonna use them to help also broaden the discussion to everyone. So when you're answering those questions, be thinking about the why. Why, did I, why am I selecting the choices um, that are presented to me? And that will give you an opportunity to help think about what it is uh, that we're really trying to get out of this meeting. So think of, uh, you know, be, be prepared to, to weigh in and share some of your thinking about those polling questions. I should say that whether you're here in the room or online or whether you're perhaps you're watching this on demand, the live recording of this, uh, your comments can also be submitted on that same web page using that same form for the next 30 days after today's meeting. Uh, so it may be uh, on your uh, journey home tonight, or if you're already at home, you, you know, sitting at the dinner table and thinking of something that maybe you forgot, you just pops into your mind, didn't come to you today. Um, please provide that as a written comment. All of the written comments that we receive will be included in the voice of the patient report, which is the summary report for this meeting. And that's going to be a report that the collective will put together as a result of this meeting. Uh, and be made available and provided to the Food and Drug Administration, as well as be made available online for re drug researchers and developers and the general public. One final thing before we get into our first set of discussion questions, I wanna go over some ground rules for today. Um, as I've mentioned, we encourage you, individuals with food allergies and caregivers, to contribute to the dialogue. Again, you can do that through the polling. Uh, you can, here in the room, raise your hand. Uh, if you're following along, you can uh, go to the call in by phone or provide your written comments. Um, we need and we want to hear from you. But I do have to say that today's discussion is limited to individuals with food allergies and their family members and direct caregivers only. Our guests from the FDA, drug developers, clinicians, you all are here to listen. I also want to mention that views expressed today are inherently personal and the discussion may get emotional at times. So, because of that, respect for one another is paramount. And also, to that end, please try to be focused and concise in your comments, so that way we can hear as many voices as possible. So, without further ado, let's get to our first set of polling questions. So, uh, we can already now just, you should have that uh, browser open on your phone for all of you here in the room. Um, if you're following along online, go to that tab pollev.com forward slash food allergy. And we can go ahead and, and get to our first polling question. These are some 
polling questions just to get a sense of our audience and the experiences that we have today. Uh, so our first polling question is, are you either an individual living with food allergies, a caregiver of someone with food allergies, or both? And for anyone in the room, please raise your hand if you're having any issue getting into the polling system. We'll send somebody your way. We just want to make sure that everyone has access to the system before moving on. So since we do have some individuals who are both someone living with a food allergy as well as a caregiver of someone living with a food allergy, uh, we ask that for the remainder of the polling questions today that you ask, answer those questions on behalf of yourself. Um, you'll see a, a lot of them are very personal, um, and so it'll help uh, with the polling if you answer for yourself. If, for example, there's another caregiver participating, maybe um, your, your spouse who is also a caregiver for your child with a food allergy, I would encourage you to have them separately participate uh, in these polling questions and answer on behalf of the, the person for whom you care. So it looks like we have a, a good uh, participation from our caregivers of people living with food allergies. Um, about 60% of our participants today um, are caregivers um, and not themselves living with food allergies. About a quarter of our participants today are individuals living with food allergies. And then a little over 10% are people that are both a caregiver and a patient themselves. We can go to our next polling question. So here, we wanna know where you or the person for whom you care resides. The options are the US Pacific time zone, US mountain time, US central time, US eastern time, US Alaska time, US Hawaii time, uh, and then outside of the US, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Canada, Mexico, or some other country or region not re represented on this slide. I promise the questions will get uh, more difficult to answer as the day goes on, um, but again, we want to get a sense of our audience today here before we start uh, some of those more, more uh, personal uh, questions. So it looks like we have uh, a little over half of our audience is from the Eastern time zone. Uh, however, we do have good representation across the United States with individuals from the Pacific Mountain and Central Times as well. If we can move to our third polling question. So here we wanna know uh, what is the gender of the person with the food allergy in your household? Again, if you're uh, a, both a caregiver and a patient, please answer on behalf of yourself. The options are female, male, non-binary, prefer not to identify, or other. I'll just give you a few more moments to get your responses in here. So we're seeing that uh, around half of our participants uh, are representing persons with food allergies that are female. Um, about a little over 40% are representing persons with food allergies that are male. And then we do have some representation from those who prefer not to identify or are uh, identifying uh, in the uh, other category. All right, we can move to our fourth polling question. So now we wanna know what is the current age of the person in your household with the food allergy? So the options are zero to 17 years of age, 18 to 30 years of age, 31 to 50 years of age, 51 to 60 years of age, 61 to 78 years of age, or 71 years of age or older. Looks like we have a bit of a gradient. We have uh, the greatest representation uh, around 40% of those in the zero to 17 year age. Uh, close behind that, around a third of participants in the 18 to 30 year age. About a fifth of our uh, audience representing uh, individuals with food allergies who are 31 to 50 years of age. Um, but we do see uh, representation across some of the uh, higher uh, age ranges, uh, 51 and above. So we definitely want to hear today about 
uh, experiences with food allergies across the lifespan, regardless of when uh, your food allergy may have started. Uh, we know that uh, symptoms as well as your, your treatment approaches might vary across uh, the age range, uh, across the lifespan. We go to our next question. So here we actually want to know what is the age that you or your loved one first had symptoms of food allergies. So this is regardless of diagnosis, actual symptom, looking back, first symptoms of food allergies. Was this birth to 17 years of age, 18 to 30 years of age, 31 to 50, 51 to 60, 61 to 70, or 71 years of age or older? So just a few more moments here to get in your response. It looks like the vast majority of our audience had their first symptoms of food allergies uh, in childhood from birth to 17 years of age, about 85% of, uh, of the participants today. However, we do have um, individuals represented who had their first uh, symptoms in adulthood, and we want to uh, hear about that and that experience. Um, that includes from the 18 to 30 year range, 31 to 50, and even 61 to 70. So please, uh, whether you're in the room, raise your hand. Uh, if you're uh, following along online, call in. We want to hear about experiences uh, both in childhood as well as uh, onset in adulthood. We go to our next polling question. So here we want to know, have you or your loved one uh, actually been diagnosed by a healthcare provider with food allergies? The options are yes, no, or not sure. give just a few more seconds. Uh, as it stands, it looks like all of our participants today have actually been diagnosed, either themselves or their loved one, living with a food allergy. Although it looks like we may have one or two people that uh, either have not uh, or are not sure. Um, all right, and if we can go to our final demographic polling question. So here we want to know, uh, and please select all that apply, um, what are you or your loved one currently allergic to? The options are peanut, tree nuts, cow's milk, egg, shellfish, thinned fish or fish products, soy, wheat, sesame, or other for any other uh, thing that you or your loved one are currently allergic to. That's not listed on this slide. One thing I want to point out is whenever we're seeing responses to a polling question that allows for more than one response, we're seeing a percentage of the total responses. So that is not the percentage of people who have actually selected a particular response. So the best way to think of this is kind of as a ranking um, based off of the size of the bar. So as you can see now, as it stands, uh, with result, uh, responses still coming in, um, that the, the great, uh, the, the thing that the is, uh, individuals are most allergic to uh, is our tree nuts, most commonly allergic to our tree nuts, followed by peanuts. Um, and after that, we actually have other. So we want to hear about the wide range of things that you're allergic to. And one thing that we don't know for sure uh, from this is, you know, how many different things you might be, any one person might be allergic to. So we want to hear about that as well. We do see that we have allergies across this whole range listed here. Um, you know, so we want to hear about uh, the range of those experiences um, that may vary based off of the allergy or allergies that you have. So that's our last uh, polling question to get us started off. And now we get to move to the, the fun part of the meeting, which is really uh, learning from you, uh, you all as experts in what it is to live with food allergies. And our first session, our first topic for the day, as I previewed, is really to dig into what it is to live with food allergies. What are the symptoms and health effects that uh, you experience as a result of living with food allergies? 
Um, so we want to know what that looks like, whether that's, you know, uh, and how it might vary, whether that's from day to day, kind of day to day um, experiences that you have, but also how it might change, whether that's week to week, month to month, or over the course of years of living with food allergies. We want to not only understand what those direct symptoms and health effects are, but also how those uh, impact your daily life. What are the activities that you either can't do as fully or maybe even at all uh, anymore as a result of your food allergy? Um, you know, maybe they aren't exactly uh, activities in your daily life, but bigger quality of life concerns, social relationships, family relationships, working, schooling. We want to hear about all of those impacts. And then the final topic that we're going to cover in this session is to focus on uh, not knowing that not all of your experiences with food allergies are things that you've already experienced, either currently or in the past, but maybe things in the future. And so we want to hear about what are your worries, your concerns, maybe even your fears for the future living with food allergies. So to get us started on this topic, uh, we have a, a panel of your peers who will be sharing their experiences living with food allergies. We have Brandon, Justin, Kay, Lisa, and Stephanie. Brandon, I'd like to invite you to the stage to kick things off. Good morning. I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak here. Um, my name is Brennan Williams. I am from Danville, Kentucky. I am 19 years old. I was diagnosed with uh, egg and dairy allergy at the age of 13 months. I thankfully outgrew the dairy allergy rather quickly, but egg is one that has stuck around. And I would like to speak on how it was growing up through school. Um, in elementary school, it was an interesting time of little kids not knowing any better and sometimes throwing food around would always give me anxiety or I'd worry what if one of these kids took something from my lunchbox and swapped it with his. Um, mildly unreasonable fears now that I'm older but at the time it was it was very serious. I was I was worried and one of the solutions that this school implemented was sitting me with um, kids with other allergies at the end of a table and I would always sit with them but as time grew on I realized that they didn't exactly enjoy me there which felt not great it was very ostracizing um, but once I was out of elementary school and moved to middle school things got better and worse um, I was I had more friends I had more people that were understanding but the bullying about the allergy the teasing the questions um, the threatening to get me sick was by far the most atrocious thing I've heard because they, they don't understand what that really means to someone with a food allergy. That is beyond serious, and I have to explain that to them every time. And most of the reactions I get were um, disregard for my concern, and that, that hurt. That really hurt. The school offered to allow me to not bring my lunch and just uh, make it safe for me, but considering the distrust I already had in my fellow students and the inaction by the school to do anything when I brought it up, led me to not trust the kitchen staff as well. I, I didn't want to risk getting sick. That was my biggest fear, was getting sick. And the uncertainty of safe food, just not only by the school staff, but also from fellow parents, whether they brought cupcakes or cookies to any event, or whether my friends said their mom had brought something. And even when they said their mom had made it safe or made an effort, I, I couldn't trust them, which made me feel very bad because their friend, my friend, went out of their way to tell their parents to make something safe for me and I still didn't feel safe eating it. Because there's only a handful of people nowadays that I can trust to make food safe for me. Um, and with 
this constant fear and untrust of friends, it made social activities really hard. It made school trips very difficult. Um, even just parties with friends was, it's, it's always stressful. It's always, what am I going to eat? How am I going to get food? What if I get sick? What if I get sick is the, is the first question in my mind at all times, no matter where I go. And I, I remember that, that fear of getting sick and expressing that to some of my friends on a, on a school team, whenever we went out to eat, I, it was always met with, well, you can get your own food, or you make the decision on where we can go, you say what we can eat, and as much as I appreciated them having looking out for me, wondering what, what can we do, it also put the entire effort onto me. And that, that built up over time, and I eventually just told people, don't worry about it, I will get my own food. I'll figure something out, you do what you want, I'll get myself sorted. And I just put, I put myself away, I avoided it entirely. And that, that I wish I didn't have to do. I wish I could just go with them and spend time with them instead of making the decision of do I, do I risk it, do I go there and see what I can find, or do I just say no and avoid the situation altogether? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Justin, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois, but I currently live in New York City. I've only known life with food allergies. When I was young, I was allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, chickpeas, and pineapple. I've outgrown my peanut and pineapple allergies, but remain severely allergic to tree nuts, sesame, and chickpeas. I don't remember my first allergic reaction, uh, but my parents have described it to me many times. I was at a water park near my childhood home when I, as a toddler, had a bite of my mom's hummus wrap. As she describes it, I blew up like a balloon, turning red and blotchy. I started wheezing, but thankfully we were very close to an emergency room where I was quickly diagnosed, treated, and released. I was fortunate to have access to an allergist who was able to quickly see me, diagnose my specific allergies, and counsel my parents through management strategies. When my parents described the experience, they often discussed the fear and anxiety of watching my condition deteriorate, as well as the relief of my recovery. Again, I was young, I don't remember this specific experience, but these feelings of fear, anxiety, and relief would become all too familiar during my future food allergy related emergency department visits and hospitalizations. As a child, I trusted the adults around me to keep me safe and uh, know how to use my epinephrine auto injector. When I became old enough, I took on more of this responsibility, bringing my own snacks to events, practicing how to use my auto injector and teaching my friends as well. I'm not sure how many of them, other people with food allergies, most of whom have to do this growing process, also once shot it through their thumb accidentally. I'll never forget the first time I had to use my auto injector for real. I was in my middle school between classes when I graciously accepted a Chips Ahoy cookie from a friend. I knew cross-contamination happened, but I was young and the label had said it was only processed with my allergens, not that it actually contained any. I just wanted to enjoy the treats my friends brought, and I had had snacks with similar labeling before. Nearly all commercial products have some sort of precautionary allergen labeling, and it's near impossible to find anything without it. Furthermore, these labels feel neither clear, consistent, nor well understood. Shortly into the next class, my arms began to itch, and a few minutes later, my chest as well. I next recognized what I feared I might a niche in my throat, the feeling that it was about to become more difficult to breathe. I was anxious, partially because I didn't have an auto injector nearby. My school required the nurse hold on to them. 
how could this happen? I was embarrassed. Did I try something new? And I was also terrified of what might follow. Before this experience, I had had allergic reactions, but the symptoms were mild, or I was too young to remember, or I was close enough to an emergency room or a fire department to get treated. I went and told my teacher I thought I was having an allergic reaction, and she could certainly hear it in my voice as I began to wheeze. She quickly walked me to the nurse's office down the hall, and with each step, I heard my wheeze worsen. Almost immediately after arriving to Nurse Ross's office, she administered an epinephrine auto-injector and called 911. They wheeled me out of my school and took me to the hospital, and kids talked about it for the rest of the year. Experiences like this can be traumatizing for young kids, as they were in some ways for me. There's a persistent anxiety that people with food allergy experience. Food is all around us, and it's vital to our survival. You can have one great plan for the day and end up spending most of it in the emergency room. And when you've had life-threatening allergic reactions, you fear something as, as small as a cashew. I've had reactions since, probably around once a year or every other, and some are worse than others. Often they're mild. I know I've had an allergen as soon as it hits my tongue and can avoid severe symptoms. Other times I don't, and I'll soon begin vomiting, itching, wheezing, and needing my epinephrine. Once I had to be admitted to the hospital because of my respiratory symptoms, which are also often exacerbated uh, because of my asthma. I am most often exposed because I forget to disclose my allergies to a food service worker. For example, you don't necessarily expect a house dressing to be a walnut vinaigrette. Or the other example is when labels are incorrect or cut short due to, due to space constraints in dining halls or store samples, for example. Um, and especially with my non-top-8 allergens, this has been particularly difficult, but thankfully with the recent passing of the 2021 FASTER Act, it'll become less so. I joined the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research at Northwestern and Lurie Children's Hospital in 2016, and our work has characterized the prevalence of food allergy and exposed the many barriers that family, food allergic families face particularly those uh, with Medicaid who are significantly underdiagnosed and less frequently seen by a specialist. I've worked as an EMT and am currently interviewing for medical schools, a commitment to others that has undoubtedly come from my, com my early and ongoing experiences as a patient. I've been able to thrive despite my allergies and I'm excited for a within reach future where food allergies can be prevented or treated and kids and adults can continue to live um, and enjoy food without fear. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kay and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm here today on behalf of my 12-year-old daughter, Karis. Karis is a fun-loving, big-hearted seventh grader. She is a competitive dancer, TikTok connoisseur, lover of all things anime, and the Green Bay Packers. She's quite normal, actually, with the exception of this thing. Karis was diagnosed with nine food allergens at the age of nine months and asthma around five years old. She currently is allergic to six of the top eight food allergens, in addition to sesame, beef, pork, and sunflower seeds. There are so many wonderful things that I would rather share with you about Karis. However, I'm here to provide a peek into our lives as, as a family impacted by food allergies. As you can see, Karis did not attend with me today. Why? because I honestly needed a break from the anxieties that come along with traveling with a child with food allergies. After a summer of traveling, I didn't have the bandwidth this time. Can we avoid Sundays? Can we avoid flying on the first and last two flights out? Where is the nearest hospital? Can we cook there? Can I talk to the manager? Did you pack the snacks? Is there a refrigerator or a microwave? These are the questions that we must address every single time we leave our home whether it's five miles down the road or 500 miles across the country. And truthfully, I needed a break today. 
This past summer, our family took several trips. They started and ended the same. Anxieties about being away from home, stress around deciding where to stay, days of the week we travel, again, no travel on Sundays, and so on. We started our last family trips a few weeks ago in a panic. We were delayed three hours on the plane while sitting at the gate. We only had enough snacks for the short two hour trip. After an hour and a half of being stuck on the plane, my husband made the bold decision to deboard in search of more food. The one restaurant determined to be our safe place had closed moments before my husband arrived. He shared with them that our daughter had food allergies and that their restaurant was the only safe place in the entire airport for her to eat. Thankfully, they accommodated us. However, when we arrived to our destination, I realized that due to our flight delays, we were in the red zone. The red zone means that one of our food allergy rules had been broken, avoiding the last two flights. Everything was closed, and our usual routine to grocery shop and eat at our safe place was foiled. The feeling of defeat consumed me, and I could see it on my daughter's face. It was consuming her too. It's that all too familiar feeling of deflation. You just never get used to it. The aforementioned is one of the many challenges we face as a family impacted by food allergies. We are exhausted and it feels as though there is no end in sight. We work to mitigate risk each day, but the anxieties are always there. They never go away. There are times we feel hopeless, especially during allergy testing. The results of my daughter's most recent food allergy test revealed no changes. I don't have the heart to tell her the news yet another reason why she isn't here today. We were really hoping to cross at least one allergen off the list, nothing. And as my daughter gets older, our anxieties increase while our hope fades. Potential dangers that we were able to control for are becoming further and further from our reach. And with each new environment comes additional worries. As I mentioned, Kara started seventh grade a few weeks ago and FAD came up. FAD is our family code word for food allergy disclosure. This time it was Karis who brought it up. I gave my husband a look and we both knew. Karis wanted to be in charge of disclosing her food allergies without any input from us. We knew this day in our lives would come. We just didn't know when. Last Friday, Karis attended her first football game alone with friends. All I could think about were the pitfalls. Peanuts in the stands, minimum hand washing, which group of friends did she FAD? Whether or not she had her rescue meds with her, what will she eat? While at the same time trusting that we taught her how to take care of herself. The mental gymnastics are exhausting, but this is our life. Admittedly, I often imagine what my daughter's life would be without food allergies. For my family, this would mean improvement of quality of life and day-to-day -day functioning and overall mental health. It would mean impromptu family trips stress-free traveling and socializing, independency and autonomy, and eating and sharing the same foods with family and friends. It's ironic that the very thing that's required for basic human survival could actually inflict harm or tragically kill. This is our reality, and even though food allergies have created this life for us, we are hopeful that one day food doesn't remain a source of stress. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Lisa, I'm from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, I actually am one of the lucky ones to be able to have food allergies myself, as well as children with food allergies. So I get to sit on both sides you know, of the playing field. Today I'm gonna share my family story with you. Most people ask me, Will your kids ever grow out of food allergies? Will you grow out of food allergies? But what they don't know is that I grew into all of my food allergies. I had my first anaphylactic reaction to food that I had eaten my entire life at 30 years old, just a few months after giving birth to my first child. One day, I was eating this food without any issues. The next day, bam, it nearly took my life. 
all at the time of the initial reaction, I was in the throes of being a tired, overwhelmed, first time breastfeeding mom. And now as an added bonus, I had become terrified to eat for fear of having another reaction. During this time, I desperately tried to deal with it in my own way. I found a few foods that I felt safe eating over and over and over again. I pushed my worries aside because I had to. I quickly became physically and mentally exhausted. Yet, I had to push it all down, keep it all inside, and just keep moving for the sake of my family. Then, just when I thought the anxiety surrounding my own food allergies couldn't get any more stressful, the pediatrician informed me that it was time to start introducing my daughter to solid foods. He gave me a list of suggested first foods to introduce to her. Oatmeal, rice cereal, fruit and veggie purees. So solid foods, be excuse me, solid foods began and things seemed to be going well for a while. She had no reaction to foods like dairy or wheat and I was feeling pretty confident that my daughter didn't have any food allergies. Whew. One year later, my confidence was shattered. It was lunchtime, and I was home alone, giving my daughter her first taste of hummus. She took a few bites of bread with hummus, and she seemed to like it. Yes, a parenting win. But then, her face and lips quickly started to swell. She began to have mucus pour out of her nose and mouth, and she was crying hysterically, but choking at the same time. I frantically took her out of her high chair and called the pediatrician, who told me to call 911. While on the phone with 911, my daughter began violently throwing up on the kitchen floor and then became limp like a rag doll. I felt helpless, scared, and alone. My daughter was having an emergency, and I froze. I had no idea what to do for her, and I was an adult who was already living with food allergies. A few weeks after this incident, we received the first official food allergy diagnosis for my daughter, and our lives were forever changed. My daughter was allergic to sesame and garlic. Full disclosure, I didn't even know it was possible to be allergic to garlic. To say my anxiety was high would be an understatement. At this point, in order to keep moving, I had to block out the trauma of my own anaphylaxis and that of witnessing my daughter's as well. Yet, I was paralyzed with fear. I felt as though I was living life on a minefield, and at any given time, I could have a misstep that would be the end. I was afraid to eat anything outside of the house for fear that I would have a reaction. I was afraid to let my daughter participate in any event that had food for fear that she would have a reaction. I was afraid to live. I honestly couldn't tell you how many life events we missed out on because of my fear. But I can tell you that it is not fun to be sitting on the sidelines watching everyone else do life. In 2016, I hit my breaking point. I had been navigating living with my own multiple food allergies, my daughter's multiple food allergies, and had since had another child who also happened to have multiple food allergies. Except, lucky me, his were completely different from mine and my daughter's. I was worn down from managing food allergies for three people with multiple top eight allergens, now top nine, non-top nine allergens, oral allergy syndrome, also known as food, pollen, pollen food syndrome, 
and food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, or FPIES, which is non-IgE-mediated food allergies. Whew. Up to this point, I had been able to avoid life most of the time. But now my kids were getting older, and they wanted and deserved to be part of life. I spent hours trying to figure out how to safely attend social events, birthday parties, parties at school, and family gatherings. I fiercely advocated at two different schools to persuade the administration to create a 504 plan to keep each of my children safe and included in all aspects of the school day. I went to the Capitol to advocate for stock epinephrine in schools and better labeling laws. I want to live without the fear of Ha having a potentially fatal reaction from one wrong bite of food at a restaurant or a friend's house. I want my kids to be included in life and not bullied or made to feel ashamed because of their food allergies. We all deserve to have a full life because even though our food may be limited, our lives do not have to be. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie and I'm from Mountain View, California. I have two daughters with food allergies. Claire is allergic to shellfish and Gabrielle is allergic to milk, eggs, peanuts, and tree nuts and has asthma. I'm a human resources professional and I was at work when I received a call from my daycare saying, your baby's coloring doesn't look quite right. She looks well, a bit blue. I was in shock and then panic as I flew into flight or fight response. I raced to the daycare while calling my pediatrician and got her over to the doctor's office where she received epinephrine. And so began our food allergy journey. We had been avoiding milk for Gabrielle as we had done a skin test for allergies before due to her skin rashes and eczema. But we had no idea what anaphylaxis could look like or that it was even possible. We had packed her sippy cup that day, but mistakenly reached for the cow's milk instead of the soy milk carton. Another day at church, there were fruit smoothies to enjoy, only unbeknownst to us, they were not just fruit, they contained yogurt and fruit. Our three-year-old said her mouth felt funny and then started vomiting a lot while we were in the car. We drove straight to the ER. When we arrived, I peeled her soiled clothes off to reveal that hives covered the top half of her body. She again received epinephrine there. A third time, we were having dinner at a friend's house and the friend prepared sippy cups from, of milk for all of the children. Not realizing they were milk filled, I gave one to our three-year-old to drink. After one sip, she stopped. One hive formed, but she started drooling profusely which could have meant that her throat was closing as she was having difficulty swallowing. The first three instances of anaphylaxis all occurred while under my care. What I learned was even as her loving mom, I could make mistakes. And a life-threatening mistake is not one you wanna make. For activities where other parents often dropped off or did their share of volunteering, I stayed at every soccer practice and gymnastics uh, workout for every ballet, ice skating, choir, and drama performance where others would volunteer, I needed to volunteer backstage for I feared that an adult volunteer might not know my child and recognize an allergic reaction or how to use an EpiPen if needed. We only vacationed in our state because I was concerned about flying on a plane with our daughter. What if she had an allergic reaction at 50,000 feet with only minutes to respond? While safety was number one, a close number two was emotional safety. 
How could I prevent my daughter from feeling left out, different, alone? Almost no food in the early years was safe for her at a birthday party where pizza, cake, and ice cream were common. All contained milk. With multiple allergens, she would never be able to eat a friend's birthday cake. Any party dessert, the most special part of a celebration for a kid, was never safe for her. She always brought her own treat and meal. How would she be able to make friends and go on a play date? And someday, maybe even go to a sleepover? How would another parent feel when I drop her off and explain what an epinephrine injector is and what signs of anaphylaxis are, a life-threatening reaction? Would they be fearful of inviting my daughter to their home? Would another parent recognize when she's having an allergic reaction and know what to do? Gabrielle has spread her wings since the early years, but there are still hiccups. In sixth grade, after several days of skipping her oral immunotherapy, OIT dose, she dosed again and had anaphylaxis. She woke in the middle of the night with red, itchy, puffy eyes and some strange, not red, bumps on her body. We went to the ER, and even then, I was in denial that it was anaphylaxis, as I couldn't tell whether the non-red bumps were hives. They were hives, and we should have given epinephrine at home when we saw the two symptoms. In eighth grade, she was traveling with her class in China and lost her medication on the first day of the trip. She had never lost her meds before. Luckily, her teacher was carrying her extra set, and yet a third set was in her suitcase. My worries as a mom of a food allergic child have changed over time as she became a teen. Gabrielle is a sophomore in high school now and loves going out with her friends. I need to trust that I've taught her what to do if she has an allergic reaction. Will she have remembered to bring her emergency meds with her? Will she recognize if she's having a reaction that requires epinephrine? Will she be able to use epinephrine if she needs it? Will her friends know what to do if she needs help? I'll keep spot checking to see if she has her meds on her and if she's taking her OIT dose. When she launches from our house, I want her to be safe in the world, wherever she chooses to be in the world. Thank you, Stephanie, and to all of our panelists for really you know, uh, being brave to start the discussion today. I know it's not easy to share, um, but that's really at the core of what we're trying to do. Um, so please, can you join me in really giving another round of applause for our whole panel. So now we have our first opportunity here today to broaden the discussion and hear from all of you, our participants here in the room, as well as all of you who are following along uh, live on the web. Um, I'm gonna do a quick shout out if you're following on the along on the web and have something you'd like to share on the symptoms and daily impacts of living with food allergy. I wanna remind you that you can start calling in uh, now at 1-703-844-3231. Again, that's 1-703-844-3231. But to get us all thinking more about this topic of the, the symptoms and health effects associated with food allergy, uh, we're gonna start this discussion with this, uh, a few polling questions. So go ahead and pull your uh, phones back out, go to that tab in the browser, um, again, this is pollev.com forward slash food allergy. This should be the same page from before. Uh, we're gonna have a, a few polling questions just to get us started here. So if we can go to our first polling question. So here we want you to think back to your and your or your loved one's most severe reaction. And we wanna know what were your or their symptoms. And here you can select all that apply. The options are hives, rash or itching, swelling, difficult swallowing or throat tightening, itching or tingling mouth and throat, chest tightening, trouble breathing or wheezing, nasal congestion, repetitive coughing, belly pain, cramps or diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, chest pain or rapid heart palpitations, fainting, dizziness or feeling lightheaded, low blood pressure, anxiety or the feeling of impending doom, 
headache, or some other symptom uh, that you or your loved one experienced when they had their most severe reaction that's not listed in the list of options. And just as a reminder, whenever we see a question that allows more than one response, these are the percentage of responses, not the percentage of people who have selected an individual response. So again, this is like a ranking of sorts. We see responses are still coming in. Uh, please select all that apply. As it stands, it looks like the most uh, common experience when having the most severe reaction has been hives, rash, or itching, followed by itching or tingling of mouth and throat. Uh, however, we see quite a few other symptoms that have been experienced during most severe reactions um, with seemingly high, high uh, numbers in our, our audience today having experienced those. Nothing here uh, has not been experienced. Uh, perhaps some of the, the less common things being low blood pressure or headache, as well as other symptoms. So regardless of which symptoms uh, you've experienced, we want to hear about this experience, your most severe reaction, and maybe how that might vary from other reactions you've had. Um, you know, try to help us understand what this experience is like from the patient perspective. Moving to our second polling question. So now we're gonna look at that same list of symptoms and we want you to select the top three most troublesome of those symptoms that you or your loved one have had. So this is not specific to your most severe reaction. This is just generally <coughs> thinking about your or your loved one's experience living with a food allergy or allergies. Which do you view as most troublesome to you, either yourself or your loved one. And again, you can select up to three responses here to represent the three most troublesome. Now this is getting to the, one of those first questions where I'm gonna ask you why uh, as part of the audience discussion. So as you're selecting these, Certainly something's probably coming to your mind, you know, that's uh, helping inform that decision of, of why one of these is more troublesome than maybe another. We saw there was a lot of experience across all of these, and now um, you're helping us understand which are most troublesome. As it stands, it looks like some of the most troublesome, at least reported by our audience today, are the chest tightening, trouble breathing or wheezing, and the difficult swallowing and throat tightening. Uh, we also see hives, rash, rash, and itching, as well as nausea and vomiting, kind of up there towards the top, along with itchy or tingling mouth or throat. What really sticks out to me, though, is also that the, every single symptom on here is in somebody's top three. And so we really want to hear about that. Why is it, again, that you've selected the th up to three that you did here? So we have one more question before we're going to throw it here to the audience and get your, your experiences. So we also want to know, uh, beyond the kind of direct symptoms uh, of food allergy, do you or your loved one experience any of, the, of these uh, various concerns because of your or their food allergy? And here you can select all that apply. The options are anxiety, anger and frustration, loneliness, bullying, depression, feeling overwhelmed, or having a sense of helplessness. We heard from many of our panelists, as well as our morning speakers, that uh, the kind of uh, psychosocial impacts of food allergies can be quite great. And so we want to know what your experiences are. All right. Well, final responses are trickling in. As it stands, it looks like uh, the most uh, Common of these concerns and experiences is anxiety, followed by uh, closely anger and frustration, loneliness and feeling overwhelmed. But again, all of these different uh, concerns have been experienced by our audience here in the room and those of you that are online today. So uh, now we're going to uh, ask you that why. And actually, I think it might be useful to start from the beginning. 
So thinking back maybe to the first symptoms experienced with your food allergy, either yourself or your loved one, um, what were those? What, what, have, what have, were your early experiences, maybe even before you were diagnosed? And how did that maybe impact your journey to diagnosis? Any volunteers here in the room? Yes, Sarah. And just hold on one second. As a reminder, we'll be bringing a mic to you. Um, please just state your name and share your comment. Okay. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm from New Jersey. And my daughter's first symptoms of her food allergies were related to hives, swelling, and vomiting. And I think one of the challenges that a lot of parents or people with food allergies experience is that the symptoms can be vague. So children vomit and children get hives. It's not always related to what they're eating. And for us, those sometimes vague symptoms have been really complicated by the vagueness of food labels. So a child is having a reaction and now you're trying to figure out, is this food allergic? You're checking the label. I, we've had experiences where we've you know, determined that it is definitely a food allergic reaction, but we've never been able to determine what in the product caused the allergy. And even at times, some manufacturers have been very helpful doing all sorts of investigations and trying to figure out, for example, cheese, was it, it's cut in one location, it's packaged in another location, is there any cross contact at any of these points? And ultimately, we've sometimes never even been able to figure it out. And do you have a sense of, uh, through you know, any other kind of diagnostic testing, your, your child's food allergies? We know she has a peanut allergy, and that's confirmed. But okay. the others are a mystery. Sure. And can you maybe share you know, uh, an example of one of the, these times where maybe you, uh, it sounds like you didn't know or it wasn't labeled or wasn't at least conclusively labeled that there might be peanut exposure to the, to the food item. What did that? Um, you know, those early uh, allergic reactions kind of actually look like? What setting did they arise? Can you maybe help paint a p little bit of a picture? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would say usually at home with a label that we've checked and then you just watch this allergic reaction developing. Sometimes there's other foods on the table and then you don't know. A lot, usually when you're eating, you're eating more than one thing. So for example, cheese and crackers. Is it the cheese or is it the cracker? There's mm -hmm. so many different things that you're trying to figure out where it could have gone wrong. Sure. And uh, were these um, reactions severe? Did you need to go to the emergency room? Were these manageable at home? We were able to manage at home, thankfully. Sure. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Other experiences? Yes. I'm one of the many that um, have adult onset food allergies and it's really interesting because the problem is the first time it happens and you think I've eaten this for decades and decades and I think I was well into my 40s when it happened so um, mine's to seafood which makes it especially challenging since it's an airborne protein mm -hmm. being able to safely enter certain restaurants and I've literally had to run out of restaurants before when I started tingling and my face started swelling so um, that's really interesting, and another problem is we have allergies and asthma, everyone in my family, so our bodies are always on overdrive. We have environmental allergies and as asthma, so we have that hyper-responsiveness and that hypersensitivity, and so um, it's, it's really difficult, and it's difficult that we have family members that don't believe us because they said, oh, well, you ate tuna fish when you were a kid. Well... <laughs> I, I can't eat anything now. And then to have an allergy to shellfish and fin fish, I have to both. So that's challenging as well. Sure. And so, you know, your uh, uh, seafood shellfish, you've been eating those your whole life. What, how did you first notice, you know, the allergy, you know, onsetting for you? With the fin fish, my husband had kissed me after he had salmon, and that's all it took. And my face started to tingle and swell in my throat started closing in and then um, same thing with um, he was cooking some seafood I think he's making clam chowder or something mm. and same thing happened and I've had that happen in multiple restaurants as well and when you say he was making the clam chowder that was just you breathed it or uh -huh. you, yeah. just being in the same room yeah yeah um, so when you were thinking about the polling question of which of those symptoms are most troublesome what what came to mind for you 
Uh, mine usually starts with the swelling in my face and, and kind of the tingling, and then mine always affects my heart as well, and my blood pressure starts to drop. Um, and then you start to panic, which doesn't help things. No matter how many times you go through this, you still panic. It's still scary. Sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, I see another hand. Jennifer. Hi. Uh, my name is Jen Gratton. My daughter, uh, Scarlett, has uh, allergies to a number of legumes and also tree nuts. And my, I wanted to make a comment just on the on diagnostics and kind of the inconsistency across diagnostic tools, but also inconsistency on the standards of care that come for, across uh, different healthcare providers and, and allergists. My daughter's uh, allergies to peas and lentils were confirmed through both symptoms, but also skin pricks, blood tests, kind of all jiving together. She also spiked for peanuts in her blood tests and uh, her skin prick. Mm -hmm. And she had been eating peanuts for months and months and months when she was, this was when she was two. And the allergist that I had at the time recommended she do a challenge given that potentially that test could have indicated for other legumes because they're in the same family. Sure. That was confirmed. And so she uh, confirmed she did not have a peanut allergy. She uh, made it, she made it through the challenge, mm -hmm. which was great. A couple years later, we moved. Uh, we went, started over with a new allergist. We go through the whole process, all of the testing, same conversation. You know, we went through this. We passed the challenge. The allergist's advice at the time was, I disagree. <laughs> even though you passed a challenge previously, her numbers are so high, I wouldn't even do one again, and you need to avoid peanuts, which for a six-year-old is one of the more intrusive, uh, just given the environment and that, that she's in. We are now switching to another allergist, starting the whole process over um, to try to do the same thing with a couple of tree nuts, but also to have that conversation with peanuts because it almost makes you as a parent want to just say, we've done it before, I wanna give it to her to say, you know, just try it <laughs> because we, we feel so confident, but at the same time you can't do that given the potential consequences. And so it's a long process, mm -hmm. um, but also just the, uh, you know, kind of the, the fact that there's there's a lack of just standards in, in reaction and, and what to do with a case like that um, has sure. been really frustrating. Sure. No, thank you for sharing that, Jen. Um, while I have you, though, um, could you maybe share some of the uh, top symptoms that, mm -hmm. that your daughter has experienced, for, I guess, for those allergens that she is, in fact, uh, allergic to or has experienced allergic yeah. reactions to? Yeah, for sure. At a very young age, as a baby, uh, she showed uh, hives and vomiting. Um, pretty consistently for mm. peas, green peas, um, and then also for lentils at daycare when she was about eight months old. Um, who knew daycares were uh, kind of uh, diverse enough to serve lentils, but uh, they were very proud that she ate them and tried them, and then also very terrified that she then immediately threw up all, all, all over them. Mm. And so those were her primary uh, tells are, are definitely hives first. She, she has an uh, itchy throat. Mm -hmm. And so now as a six-year-old, she can talk about it. And so anytime she says her throat is spicy, we know potentially mm -hmm. something has had uh, uh, an interaction that, that was not favorable in those. And she's had other reactions that we don't know what they're to. Mm -hmm. We think they might be connected to tree nuts, which um, is another one that, that spikes in blood tests, but we haven't been able to com confirm yet. But, but those, again, uh, primarily her extreme reactions have been hives and vomiting. Yeah, and, and have you noticed, you know, was her just extreme reactions um, when she was younger, you know, is there a certain pattern to when she has an extreme reaction versus a more mild one? Um, you know, we've only had one anaphylactic reaction, and that's actually the one that we don't know what it was to, okay. um, which is, you know, the most terrifying piece of it. Sure. Um, but yeah, for, for the most part, she, um, uh, she, the, we've been able to alleviate with, with Benadryl, but it's, it's been primarily uh, when she was younger, mm -hmm. because now we know more of what to avoid. and, and sure. Peas and lentils are things that I think are easier to uh, avoid outside of some of the newer pea proteins that have come into basically everything. Um, so, you know, that, that was, it was primarily when she was younger, just because I think you get a little bit, gets a little bit easier. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I think with, with those in particular, because they're, they, they don't have as high probably on the cross contact as some of the other ones of dairy and, and egg that I think some others had concerns with. Sure. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. Yes. Aaron, right behind you, Aaron. I think one of the difficulties that we all face is that we are trying to um, diagnose the symptoms of the allergic reaction 
in a situation that's already an emergency. Yes. I know for my son, he was turning blue as I'm trying to figure out whether this was in fact an allergic reaction because he hadn't just recently eaten. Um, I know that Jen brings up another point that I think is so important too, is that when we have young children, so when my child was young, he's now a teenager, so he can describe his symptoms a lot better, but when he was young, I didn't know if he could tell me if he was having an allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what words he would use. I didn't know whether it was truly an allergic reaction or whether this is just flu season or whether it was just his asthma. Um, you know, using words like spicy or so lucky that you can recognize that that means she's having a reaction. But to some kids, it might just be something that tastes salty or bubbly or something else. So there's a lot that's left to interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I know for our family, his reaction has been different each time. So it's not consistent. So one time it could be difficulty swallowing and the next time it could be a breathing issue. Mm. Um, the, the following time it could be nausea. Um, sometimes it's hives. Sometimes it's all of them in combination and sometimes it's not. And so how do you know when is the right time to use epinephrine? When is not, when is the right time to consider that it's something else? Maybe it's a bug bite, maybe yeah. it's asthma, maybe it's EOE. Um, so it's very hard to interpret this, and this is all happening typically in an emergency fashion. Um, and you yourself or your child is is left to self-diagnose under that condition. It's truly very difficult. Yeah, can you maybe help me understand that a little bit more, Aaron? You know, maybe there's one example that might stand out in your mind of a situation where you were dealing with that emergency situation. What, you know, in that case, what was the, the symptoms, the severe symptoms that he was experiencing? But you know, how did you balance that with, with trying to, uh, you know, kind of diagnose or figure out what was the cause? Yeah, uh, my son um, had eaten a safe meal mm -hmm. at a safe restaurant that we had done many, many times. Um, I'll talk about it a little later, but, um, but he was wheezing and feeling very nauseous and coughing, but it was also flu season. Mm -hmm. He also had had asthma earlier that morning. Was this just a kick up of asthma? I mean, it's hard to know. It's in the middle it's the middle of February, this is definitely a high time, and there had been lots of cases at school. Mm -hmm. It was hard to tell what was going on in the moment. Um, he started turning a, the wrong shade of blue. Um, and so, you know, you're trying to make determinations in the moment and do what's right. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I looked for confirmation from a healthcare professional, and that was difficult as well. Sure. Um, it was very, a muddy situation, and I think in the future I wouldn't have made the same decisions or hesitated nearly as much, but, uh, it was clearly an emergency situation. We had minutes right. um, to, to make these decisions and probably less than that towards the end of our process, sure. you know, our decision-making process. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing that. So I wanna uh, remind those of you who are online, uh, you can call in, uh, that number is 1703-844-3231. Um, we do have a couple of callers that I, I'm gonna go to, but I also want to remind uh, those are you on the phone or following on a lot following along online in addition to calling in you can also use that comment box under the live stream to write in with some comments and we'll be periodically reading those throughout the session as well um, but I see we have Thomas from New York uh, who wants to share a little bit about uh, how food allergies has impacted both his own and life and his life raising two boys with multiple allergies uh, Thomas are you with us Hi, Thomas, are you with us? I'll give Thomas a second here. Are you uh, with us now, Thomas? Oh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you now. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Hi, everyone. Yeah, so we'd love to hear yeah, what, uh, what impacts you wanted to share. Um, yes, no, absolutely. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, but definitely I would love to share um, my impacts. So I can start off with myself, um, you know, growing up in the late 70s, early 80s, um, having asthma and also being diagnosed with, uh, with food allergies, but through um, uh, ingesting shellfish from a gathering, a family gathering, and, um, you know, eating... Uh, specific food, especially culturally, you know, they cook with a lot of seafood, especially in Latin culture. And, you know, being diagnosed and having an anaphylactic reaction and not my family actually knowing what it is and just assuming that it's just a stomach bug and being taken to the hospital later on as I was going through anaphylaxis. 
and um, and being treated there. So even then, it was hard to actually pinpoint the symptoms that I was actually going through, especially in the emergency room, because they had no idea what to look for. Um, and to you had a physician come in and just said, just give him epinephrine, and that was kind of like mm-hmm. the holy grail for that moment. And you know, also living in in the most impoverished areas growing up, you know, food scarcity was one of the biggest things. We didn't know what safe foods were, what to avoid, and how um, resources were given to our family via our pediatrician. You know, because there was nothing there for us to really look for. So growing up was kind of cumbersome for my mom and for my family because, you know, how do you treat something you're unfamiliar with um, when the information is not provided to them? So as I got older, you know, in my teens and, and in my 20s, being more familiar what to look for for myself, you know, I was, you know, I had to advocate avoid eating specific foods and, and so on. And, you know, just throughout my life, that was just, it was just all avoidance. And still, I was still unfamiliar with what food allergies were. All I knew was to just not eat specific foods, not understanding that carrying epinephrine will be a life-saving medication that I would need in the event I do come in contact with something I'm allergic to. Um, to give you what I'm allergic to, I'm allergic to shellfish, almonds, pecans, walnuts, um, I'm also allergic to non-specific foods like iodine, aspirin, ibuprofen, um, those things I'm also allergic to, and also can call it anaphylaxis um, if given to me. Fast forward a little bit in my life, got married, um, found out my wife also has food allergies. Um, she's also allergic to um, almonds, pineapple, garlic, uh, to name a few. You know, things are good and, you know, managing that still um, not really cap- carrying epinephrine at the time, just just playing a role in avoidance, you know, and not eating at certain places just to <laughs> just to um, be safe. And then we had our first son, Sebastian, in 2012, in August, and that was the most exciting and most memorable moment for us. And until, like, uh, within, like, his six month, six months when he started rejecting um, his mom's breast milk, and he just started looking lethargic, and he, he was just weak, and we were trying to figure out what was wrong. And then we took him to his pediatrician, and they was like, they couldn't figure out. We took him to a specialist. Figure out, though, an allergist. Um, examine him and find out that he is allergic to dairy. And so, you know, my wife, um, so we changed his, um, his feeding and started giving him a formula that contained, that didn't contain any animal protein whatsoever. It was just more providing all the nutrients that he needed. And immediately he started um, changing from that and looking so much better. Um, but later on, we found out he's allergic to peanuts um, through trial and error. You know, like these are things that, you know, we have no idea that he was allergic to. He was allergic to peaches as well and eggs. And, you know, just like, oh, my God. So my family, the impact on just having my first son is changing up everything that we have in our home. And especially when it came down to food. And we had to bring a lot of foods that were safe. And I had no idea about what to do in that <laughs> at that moment in a- yeah and thomas can you maybe you know uh, hearing you know yourself your wife your children um living with food allergies and sounds like different uh maybe overlapping food allergies um how has that impacted your uh family's ability to you know I, you, you talked about making changes in the home what about your activities in life outside of the home yeah so with that activities outside the home, it's, I, I think I, I had so much anxiety outside the home, especially if we were going to a family gathering, to a restaurant. Um, I didn't trust anyone. I didn't trust anyone with giving my son food or uh, going to a restaurant and him maybe touching a surface and something on that surface that they say they cleaned, but they didn't really clean. Um, it was just, anxiety driven and fear of the what if and you know 
it was it was that. I think I had more fear and anxiety than my wife at the time because I know how severe uh, a reaction can be, and and if not treated, can be uh, quite detrimental. And you know that was one thing that that it continues to stick out today, even with my son Sebastian. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's just it's just very hard. It's like you know, do we do we trust the people that we bring our children to, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend's house, a restaurant, a play date, a playground, a school? How do we manage that without the mental anguish that we have to you know be in on a daily basis? Sure. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for for calling in and sharing your experiences and your families. And of course, your son's experiences as well. I also see that we have another caller, Susan from North Carolina, uh, that would like to share uh, some of her experience with different allergens. Uh, so I'd like to see if uh, Susan, if you are with us. Uh, Susan, are you with us? Sometimes it's a little bit of a surprise when I call on you uh, out of the queue. So I just want to check again. Susan from North Carolina, are you uh, with us now? If you can hear me, I cannot hear you. So uh, please say something. OK, well, we'll try to get you back, Susan, in a moment. Um, but I want to expand that the, the discussion um, from the direct symptoms, health effects, of course, the severe reactions that we've been talking about, and try to uh, understand the impacts that they are having in daily life. And I know we've, of course, started to explore this with our panel. Um, so I'd like to go to a, a polling question just to get us thinking about this uh, particular uh, topic. So again, pull out your phones, uh, open up that tab in the browser for those of you following along online. Here we want to know what activities are most important to you that you or your loved one are not able to do or struggle to do due to your food allergies. And here we want you to select the top three uh, activities that are most impacted. So this could be sleepovers with friends, enjoying food or eating generally, going out to eat in public settings, participating in social engagements or events, participating in family activities or in traditions participation in sports or recreational activities, attending school or having a job, traveling, or some other activity that's important to you that you're either not able to do or struggle to do because of your or your loved one's food allergies. And you can select again uh, up to three, so the top activities that are most impacted in you and your family's life. So responses are still coming in, but as it stands, it looks like uh, perhaps some of the top, uh, the top, top three uh, activity impacts are going out to eat in public settings, uh, as well as participating in social engagements or events. Um, following that, it looks like there's traveling and enjoying food or eating generally um, are some of the top impacts. And then really, though, we're seeing um, each of the different activities listed here as being in somebody's, uh, or at least some part of the, the participants today's top three uh, activities that are either not able to be done or struggle with. And so we really wanna know the specifics here. You know, what does this look like? You know, we've heard about some of the different symptoms and, and, and reactions, but we also know that some of these things are um, things that you deal with even in the absence of those symptoms in an in a, uh, uh, attempt to avoid exposure. Uh, but we want to know what that really looks like and what modifications have you had to make to your lives or have it experienced maybe uh, outside of your control that's limited these activities. Yes, Lillian. Hi, my name is Lillian. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, just to speak a little bit about daily struggles. Um, being a college student, some of the biggest things are, you know, making new friends and going out to eat with those friends. And that's obviously really hard. I've become known in a lot of my friend groups as, you know, the one with the peanut allergy. And, you know, I feel like a lot of us can relate to that. 
when you because when you introduce yourself you have to introduce your food allergy as well because it's a big part of your life and although I don't like being known by that it is also important um, when it comes to going out to eat though I think it produces a lot of anxiety going to a new restaurant and taking a bite out of something new the anxiety you feel and you wonder oh my gosh am I having a reaction or is that me just freaking out because this is something new even having a familiar food and maybe it has a different texture or something that night, thinking, is there something in this? Did they change it? Um, so just a lot of anxiety surrounding going out to eat and then also feeling like a burden. If you go out with your friends and you're having to talk to the waiter and ask them lots of questions about, you know, how safe is this food for me to eat? Do you guys have these products in the facility? So, yeah, just difficult in general. Yeah, and so um, whether it's, you know, out of the, the anxiety or actually, you know, knowing that it's, you have experienced some of those scares, um, as well as kind of the, the, as you described, kind of like the social impact of being, you know, uh, standing out as the one with the peanut allergy, um, have you, has that led to you, uh, you know, going out with your friends less or modifying, you know, how you, how you uh, engage with your friends? What, what does that look like? Yeah, so obviously um, a lot of my friends don't have food allergies, so it's kind of up to me to educate them on that, and I'm happy to do that. And it's been great to see a lot of my close friends, they know what restaurants I can eat at and what restaurants I can't eat at. And if we're ever in a group setting with new people and someone suggests we go to you know, an Asian food restaurant, I'm usually not able to eat at a lot of those places. They know to say, they usually speak up before me and are like, Lillian can't eat there, why don't we go somewhere else? And I like it's really cool to see that. And obviously it gets more difficult when I get into bigger groups and things like that. So I do often find myself saying, no, you know, I'll wait and go out another time if they decide to go to a restaurant because I don't want to be uh, an implication or you know something that causes them to not be able to go where they want to go. So you know it can go both ways, but I think um, educating my friends and seeing them then advocate for me has been a great experience. Oh, absolutely. And maybe outside of restaurants, are there any other uh, you know kind of limitations or, or places that you uh, avoid going out with your friends? Uh, well, I guess I think mostly about traveling as well. A lot of my friends you know want to take trips over the summer and go places and. Yeah. Flying has always been a very anxiety-producing event. Um, thinking about if the if they had served peanuts on a prior flight, I'm very sure to make sure they don't serve peanuts when I'm on the plane. But thinking about what if things mm. weren't cleaned properly, what if there's right. dust from the peanuts in the air, and obviously that air is circulating, it's very stressful. Um, but I'm trying to get better about that and about uh, advocating for myself as now being an adult. and um, teaching again my friends about that and being like okay well before we go somewhere before we travel even if we travel in the car somewhere mm -hmm. we have to plan ahead what restaurants are we going to go to what snacks do we have in case i'm not able to eat at a restaurant things like that yeah and you said you're you're getting better at it uh um, is this something that you've lived with through childhood and, and if so you know how has that kind of social impact maybe changed you know as your peer group has you know gotten older hopefully more mature Yes, for sure. I think in elementary school, it was more so, you know, kids at that age, they don't really understand. And so, and I don't even think I fully understood, you know, it was more of my mom watching out for me and making sure I was doing what I was supposed to do. When it got to middle school, it got more hard because then even those kids who didn't understand then took it as a way to bully me or would mm. chase me around with peanut butter crackers and things like that. And obviously coming into that knowledge of, wow, this could really, you know, this could kill me. I mean, this could affect my life in a serious way. It's scary. And so um, going, I've definitely seen that change in my peers going from not knowing and then that stage and then within high school and college being able to get the independence and the feeling that mm -hmm. I can advocate for myself and tell others how serious it is has been definitely a big change. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lillian. Yeah. Others, yes, we'll come here to Lisa. So as an adult living with food allergies, um, one of the things that I've really had to think about is traveling by myself mm -hmm. and how do I do that safely? Um, you know, I travel for work. I, I travel for things like this. Um, you know, I, I've been places where I've made my own food and just thrown it in my bag. And to me, I try to focus on it's not about the food. As long as I have something to eat, it's about the experience. 
and it's taken a while to get there. You know, I, with so many different food allergies that I have, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't necessarily find it easy at all to be able to be accommodated a lot of places food wise. Um, so I, I just kind of throw stuff in my bag and bring it with me. And, mm-hmm. you know, the other thing that as a, an adult living with food allergies, we have to think about is like a contingency plan, mm-hmm. right? So when I'm at a conference, I make sure that I at least know one person that knows where my hotel room is. And if I don't come down for like breakfast at a certain time, they get someone to come up to mm-hmm. make sure I'm okay. Oh. Because we don't think about it, but let's say we're having dinner at eight o'clock at night at a, at a function for a, a conference. Yes. And if I did eat something, and had more of a delayed response or reaction, I need to make sure I'm okay, mm-hmm. right? But if I'm by myself, I don't have that, that other person necessarily. Mm-hmm. So I really conscientiously have had to problem solve that. You know, one of the other things as a parent or caregiver in terms of traveling and the impact and things like that, mm-hmm. I have to model for my kids that it's not something to be ashamed of And that's really challenging, Mm -hmm. right? Because we don't want to go out to dinner and have to share our entire medical, you know, history just to order a safe sandwich. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's literally what we have to do in order to order a safe sandwich. So it's really trying to navigate how do you educate people and advocate for yourself with, at the same time, not feeling like a burden, not feeling like, oh, you know, this is something I don't want to do. And one of the things that, again, I've had to learn to do is learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because really, that is how we have to live a lot of our lives. It doesn't have to be that way. If we had different, you know, different things that were changed, whether it's labels or education, treatments, all of that can make a huge impact. Sure. And so when you're thinking about traveling, um, you know, in your personal experience, you know, is, you know, as time has gone on, you know, has, you know, have you, you know, had more allergies that eventually you've gotten to the point where you've kind of, you have this mind shift of it's not about the food, it's about the experience. Um, But at the end of the day, are there, does that, does it make you travel less or do you really, you know, uh, or do you avoid certain activities when you travel, you know, as a result of this? Um, I want to say no. (laughs) In reality, it makes me take more of a pause before I accept different travel plans. Or do I have the time to pre-plan? Because if not, I can't go. Or my family can't go to certain Mm -hmm. places. We can't just hop in the car and say, oh, we're going to go visit friends in Maryland today um, or this weekend. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have the time to pre-plan, to look at restaurants, to look at Uh, food shopping places in the area, what type of hotels have a kitchen, things like that, I can't go. It's not that easy. Um, So does it impact me and does it, do I have to say no sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Sure. Thank you. Yes. And then Carrie, uh, I think it looks like we have some comments from the web. take a moment to read some of the written comments that have come in um, from those who are joining us online. So make sure their voices are heard too. So we have Tracy from San Diego, California, who says, my four-year-old son has an egg allergy and it has been limiting his ability and our ability to fully enjoy things like birthdays or eating out. Cupcakes, cakes, and cookies are all things he cannot enjoy with his friends and we struggle to feel comfortable and confident leaving our son in the care of others. The mental and emotional toll his allergy takes on us is way more significant than I anticipated. Additionally, we have Kim from Oakland, California. Kim says, what has the greatest impact on our quality of life is the amount of planning that needs to go into everything for our two sons. The concept of carefree doesn't exist with food allergies. We can't just leave the house with the confidence that we can pick up food anywhere easily. Travel considerations include whether we can stay somewhere with the kitchen and how far the nearest hospital is. Play dates include a bag of safe, sac- excuse me, safe snacks and an epinephrine auto injector. While we try our best to not have this define our lives, it is a constant worry operating below the surface and occasionally rising above if there is a reaction. This impacts our everyday life. 
Thank you. Thank you to all of you who have been writing in with those comments. Very powerful. Please keep them coming. And Carrie will continue to uh, read those throughout the program. I want to go to the, the phones for a moment. Uh, we have Francesca from Utah who has a daughter uh, with a milk allergy and wants to describe some of the, uh, the impacts it's had on, on her daughter in her life. So Francesca, are you with us? Francesca, just checking with you. Let me know if you can hear me. Are you with us? Give it a, another go here. Uh, just checking. Francesca, uh, you are live. If you are, are with us, can you let me know? No. OK, it sounds like Francesca may have dropped. Um, so we'll come back to the phones in just a moment. Did we have a hand in the room over here? Yes, Candice. Candice, um, I happen to be the mother of one of our panelists today, Brandon. Um, so we've been dealing with his food allergy for nearly 20 years. So um, when he was diagnosed in 20, um, 2002, excuse me, that was pre-allergen labeling act. Um, so, you know, we had to memorize that giant list of derivatives and all of that business. So um, we've been very lucky that his egg allergy is considered one of the top nine allergens. So when we're talking about like FDA grocery foods, it's a lot easier. Um, to manage that. So our food allergy journey was sort of turned on its head last year when my husband was diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the um, tick bite um, induced, that may not be the right word, um, allergy to mammalian products. And so for him, that has meant zero restaurants, zero social eating. Um, we were very lucky in that we, that our recent um, vacation was to an area that had access to vegan restaurants. So for the first time in a year, he was able to eat out. Um, in, the, in where we live, we don't have access to that. So 100% of his food has been homemade in our kitchen. Mm. Um, and so every event that he goes to, he has to either eat before or after or take his food. Um, and one of the things that I remember um, from our allergist recommendation, so we were talking about um, they're both involved, the boys are involved in scouting. Um, so when they do camping trips and, well, what if, you know, one of the boys accidentally grabbed the cookware that we use and, you know, had some cross contact with that, you know, what do we do? And his, he, what he said was, you just don't eat. Don't take that risk. It's much better to be hungry for that 24 hours than to risk um, having a reaction in the middle of nowhere and having to, like, handle, do we have cell signal? Can we make that emergency call? Can we get you to an emergency room? How far out are you? So those are the things that we've kind of managed um, over yeah. the last 20 years and then again for the last year. Sure, so maybe two follow-up questions. So with, um, your, I, you said it was your husband with Alpha-Gal. Yes. Um, having to bring food or eat before and after, and it's, the question's gonna be the same, but then also with the scouting and you know uh, knowing that there might be a moment where you won't have something to eat for 24 hours. You know, has that led to a retraction from some of those activities, doing them less frequently, um, you know, in order to have, you know, avoid those types of, of situations? Um, I think I probably echo a lot of the comments that have been made. Like, I want to hug everyone in here <laughs> um, for the shared experience that we all have and that, like, anxiety that we constantly live with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so many of the things that our kids don't understand that we went through when they were young and as they mm -hmm. were growing. And, all of that planning and management, and like there, there is no carefree. I, I totally echo that comment. Um, and I think that we just, like we make a lot more planning and we pack a lot more safe food mm -hmm. for those types of events. And we try to say, you know, like if we're flying, we can't just rely on how many hours are we in the air. We have to plan on, well, what if my plane gets trapped for that eight hours on the tarmac? Right. Um, like, do we have enough food to last us for that much longer? And that's where I'm sort of grateful for packaged foods and the labeling act and that we, but, but with alpha gal, that's kind of a different creature. Sure. Um, but again, you know, at least, at least the ingredients are there. Whereas in social situations or restaurant situations, like the regulations are not the same. So that makes it a little more tricky there. So I think perhaps there were some events that we chose not to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the discussions we had continually as he was growing up was it's not about the food. It's about the experience. So which is more important and we allowed him as he grew older to make that decision. Like, 
are you comfortable being in this situation where there's food present? Is it more important for you to simply be in that social environment with your friends, with your peers, right. um, and allowed him to make that decision? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Candace. Yes. We'll come over here. Uh, my name is Maeve. I am from Columbus, Ohio, and I wanted to kind of share the, the perspective of the other end of it. Um, so as an adult who lives with food allergies, um, kind of similar to what Lillian was sharing earlier, it's been wonderful to be able to be my own advocate. But one of the frustrating things then that that also means is that you necessarily have to invite other people into your experience and your disability and your, your chronic disease. And I struggle to name another disease or another situation where other people necessarily have to be invited into that experience to protect you. Um, and the frustrating piece about that is that now you are dependent on someone asking those questions. And yet a lot of times those questions are coming from what almost seems like a lens of entertainment. The idea of trying to understand, well, how badly can this go wrong? How quickly, um, how fatal is this for you? But if you don't answer those questions, now you are potentially putting yourself in a hazardous situation. So the frustrating piece is that, yes, people want to know, but maybe not necessarily from the lens um, that, that you would appreciate most. Um, but if they don't ask those questions and if you don't answer them, you aren't necessarily keeping yourself safe. Sure. And, and has that impacted or put a strain on your friendships, social relationships, or maybe the things that you do with your friends? I think that um, it has differently impacted friendships versus professional relationships with people. Um, friendships, uh, those, those relationships and those questions uh, are, are had pretty early on. Um, and um, it, it almost becomes something that you are, you are willing to engage in in a lighthearted conversation mm -hmm. about your food allergies, where in a professional relationship or a professional setting, now all of a sudden you are inviting somebody into something that can be quite personal for you um, or quite anxiety inducing, and now you are having to be quite vulnerable in a professional setting where most other people don't necessarily have to cross that social threshold that early in that type of relationship. So it definitely shifts the perspective of the types of relationships that you have with other people. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I do want to go to a, a polling question. Uh, it's our last one of the session. This is kind of the final broadening of this topic, which is to look and think about also what are our worries and concerns for the future living with food allergies. So go ahead, pull your phone back out, open up that tab, go to pollev.com forward slash food allergy. And we want to know what worries you the most about you or your loved one's food allergy, thinking about the future. And here, please select the top three. The options are risk of accidental exposure, more limited social engagements, limited social support, ability to access safe food or difficulty avoiding one's allergens, mental health issues due to food allergy, being bullied, troubles with life transitions and lack of independence due to food allergy, ability to read, understand food labels, new or unexpected food allergies, worsening reaction to a node food allergen, or other, some other that worry that you have uh, about your or your loved one's food allergy. And again, please select up to the top three uh, that you uh, are, are most worried about thinking about the future living with your food allergy. We'll give you a few more moments to get your responses in. As it stands, it looks like uh, the, the greatest concern is the uh, risk of accidental exposure, um, followed by uh, maybe second, but a number of things clustered together here, the ability to access safe food and a diffic the difficulty of avoiding one's allergens, the mental health issues due to the food allergy, um, but really we're seeing all of these different worries in many or in, in some of our participants top three. So we wanna uh, include that in the discussion. And I think we have a, a caller whose uh, uh, experience will actually uh, uh, complement this nicely. Uh, it was actually someone we tried to get on before, Francesca from Utah, 
and wanted to speak about her daughter. So I want to see if we can uh, get Francesca. Are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. Thank you. So um, my, uh, my daughter uh, is 18. She just turned 18, and she's a new college student. She's allergic to cow's milk proteins and all of them severely. And um, she was diagnosed at six months old but had symptoms at birth. And um, one of the, the most difficult uh, things uh, about her food allergy is um, at age 15 she was suicidal. And that's, as a parent, that's very difficult to deal with. And through therapy um, and counseling, the, it was determined that her, her suicidal uh, feelings were because of her food, anxiety, food allergy anxiety and the way uncaring people treated her because of her food al allergy. So I, re I remember her coming home from a church activity early, and I said, oh, you're home early, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, they were having this food that could kill her because <laughs> of her food allergy. And she said, she said, you know, they they have had a relationship with milk longer than they've had a relationship with me, and they care more about having milk there than they care about having me there. And so these kind of attitudes really affect the mental health of our children. And um, and it's very difficult um, to, uh, I know as a new college student, she has said, um, it's difficult for me to make new friends because I hate leading out with my food allergy and um, and I don't want to be defined by that. But every time you try to, you know, social things, there's always food. Let's, let's, you want to get to meet people, there's always food. Um, we, we can't attend uh, family and social gatherings many times because of food issues. And, and so it's very difficult um, uh, to deal with the mental health issues that come up because of having to deal with this stress from an early age, dealing with your own mortality and having to avoid exposure and um, not having um, uh, therapies uh, that can cure it or treat it appropriately. I mean, we're grateful for epinephrine, but, um, uh, you know, cow's milk, uh, many times people don't understand that, you know, touching butter and, 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 and if she touches that and rubs her eyes, she can be anaphylactic, according to our allergist. And so um, it's at pizza parties, they freak you out. <laughs> and, um, and so it's just a really huge concern. Yeah. No, and, and thank you for sharing that, Francesca. Um, are you, uh, or I guess, is your daughter, you know, still uh, experiencing the, those same mental health concerns? Is this something as she's, uh, I, I think you said she's an uh, adult now, um, you know, that she's you know, been able to learn to cope with or, or is managing? Well, you know, you manage as best you can. Um, but you know, as she's starting college and having to deal with making new friends and 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 that level of independence, um, you know, it's it's difficult. And and I, as a parent, I see her anxiety rise, and I see I see that um, she couldn't attend with us today uh, to speak for herself because she had work. But um, I just wanted to make sure that that voice was heard. That it's it it is very difficult. Um, and and. And you try to put a positive spin on it, and you try to, you know, do the best you can, and um, but it's still difficult. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate you bringing this into the discussion today. We really do appreciate you calling in. Um, I want to go to one other caller, and then I think we're going to uh, take any final uh, words here in the room. But I want to go to Diane from New York, who also wants to talk about some of the impacts uh, with her three kids with food allergies. That, that, what that has Hi, how are you? Life. How is everybody? Hi, Diane. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I know, I know you're rushing a bit, so I wanted to echo um, a lot of what was said, um, just like the previous lady said. Yeah, I have, I have well, I have four kids, um, anaphylaxis to dairy, egg, nuts, soy, fish, carrots, beans, on and on and on. Um, and the anxiety is definitely, um, during COVID, I've seen this pea protein in everything. So unfortunately, twice in a matter of two weeks, um, my youngest had to have six EpiPens, three back-to-back, -back, 
overnight in the hospital, almost needs to be intubated again two weeks later. So he is a complete mess now. He won't even have a glass of water without, is this okay for me to drink? Is this okay for me to drink? There's no ingredients on water. Like, I see the anxiousness, which is awful. Um, and then the lack of independence, I always thought as I got older it would be easier. So I have t two teens, and it's, you know, it's never easy. We all know that. But it's harder in different ways now. Um, you know, they want to cut the cord. They want some independence. And h how do you give that to them? You know, we, we made our first trip ever because we were told we couldn't even fly. And we went to Ireland where, where relatives are from. We did so much research, talked to relatives. We were sure we could eat there safe. And we never go to hotels. I always get a kitchen. There was nothing my kids could eat. They literally all lost between 7 and 10 pounds, and they lived on potato chips and fruit. So now here it is. He's having his senior trip. It's not even like he just can't go. It's horrible um, because, you know, he's going to be alone, number one. Number two, even with my research, neither of us trust that he's going to be able to eat. So that's another thing. His friend, you know, he can't go to this. He didn't want to go to the prom because I'm not going to be able to eat anyway. Everyone's going to ask me why I'm not eating. So there's this whole thing like he wants to go away to college. You know, everything you read says, oh, it's manageable. But when you have this many allergies, I don't, you know, I don't know how. I don't. We don't want to put it off the table. But he's not even comfortable. He's like, you know, I can find safe food. He's like, what's it going to be, mom? Like two things I can eat. So I don't know how you give them that independence when it's just so terrifying. Sure. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that and uh, not only the, the impacts on, on daily life and traveling, but this concern about navigating, uh, you know, your children's independence uh, as a concern. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to look here to the, our audience in the room. Any, any final thoughts on worries, concerns for the future? Of course, we'll have the afternoon to, re to continue the conversation. Uh, but in, in case someone had a, a burning final thought, wanted to make sure we get that now. Okay, uh, so with that, it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, a speaker who's going to be providing a, a bit of a morning recap. We have Eleanor Guerra Holding, who's the CEO of Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection Team. Uh, welcome, Eleanor. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. We've heard many moving stories about people living with food allergies today and the emotional costs they pay every day. For Brandon, it's a challenge to find safe foods he can eat and enjoy. He struggles with poor nutrition and constantly feeling tired and weak. Not ideal conditions for a growing teenage boy. The fear of getting sick when eating out with friends had led to multiple panic attacks. It's become, in his words, an eat or be hungry problem that he has been preparing for his whole life. Poor nutrition is a problem faced by many food allergy families. Some have very limited safe food choices. Others rely heavily on packaged processed foods because the ingredients are generally more transparent than freshly prepared foods. But they end up missing out on important nutrients. Labeling laws also leave a lot of gray area around what may or may not be in packaged foods. Justin described the persistent anxiety that people with food allergies live with. He took on an enormous amount of responsibility at a young age, practicing how to use an epinephrine auto-injector, showing his friends how to use it, bringing safe snacks to parties, and talking with friends and strangers about food allergies. Anytime Dr. Kay and her family leave the house, the trip must be meticulously planned due to her daughter's food allergies. We're talking military precision and the timing and details. Add to that the social pressures of food allergies. There were times in elementary school when food allergies isolated Karis from her classmates. Now that Karis has started middle school, she wants to fit in without judgment, just like any other child. And these new experiences add to her family's stress and exhaustion. Imagine the stress of a simple trip to the grocery store for someone like Lisa, who developed food allergies after the birth of her first child, only to find herself just a few years down the road struggling to manage completely different food allergies for her two children as well. Feeding her family at home is difficult enough. How do you keep your family safe outside the home? Lisa's first instinct was to withdraw from life, 
but as any parent knows, you can't simply isolate your children. Lisa's children want and deserve to be part of life, and Lisa wants that for them. And for Steph, food allergies not only changed family life, but her career and ability to share her culture with her daughter. Gone were the days of family dinners at local Chinese restaurants or takeout from the Chinese deli. They did not attend large family gatherings due to fears of an allergic reaction on a plane or a cruise ship. Steph has volunteered for every event her daughter participates in and has stayed at every party long after other parents have left to ensure her daughter's safety. She quit her job to be home with her daughter, then took a new job close to home rather than ones that offered opportunities for growth so she would be nearby in case of an emergency. That's just part of the financial burden of living with food allergies. Allergen-free foods are usually more expensive than other packaged foods and can still lack the nutrition our families need. There's the cost of doctor's visits and allergy testing, and families must buy new epinephrine auto injectors every year because these medications expire, and that's if they can find a pharmacy with epinephrine in stock, given the drastic medication shortages over the past few years. Even with insurance coverage, families can pay hundreds of dollars for a two-pack of epinephrine auto injectors. We truly need more affordable epinephrine delivery devices available to all patients. To share a bit about my personal experience, my son was 19 months old when he had an anaphylactic reaction to pecans at a family party back in 2004. We had no family history of food allergies. In the seven minutes it took to get him to the emergency room after one bite, of a pecan. My son Thomas became almost unrecognizable to me. He had highs from head to toe, swollen lips and eyes, and once the hospital staff stabilized him, they admitted him to the pediatric unit for observation until the next day. We were not given a prescription for epinephrine upon discharge. Instead, we were told to follow up with our pediatrician, which we did the same day. I was working at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago at the time and was able to get Thomas in quickly for testing and diagnosis. He was allergic to all tree nuts, peanut, and sesame. And even though I worked in the healthcare field, I knew nothing at the time about food allergies or anaphylaxis and was scared beyond belief. I quickly learned that I was not alone and that education and support were available in my community, which unfortunately is not always the case. So educating myself and my family and friends was my top priority to keeping Thomas safe and alive, reading labels, avoiding his allergens inside and outside the home, educating staff at restaurants and schools along with nannies became our way of life. At age three, Thomas was diagnosed with asthma and eosinophilic esophagitis and his EOE triggers were milk and wheat. Wheat later became a food allergy as well. At age seven, Thomas's peanut allergy level was low enough to try an oral food challenge, which right now is the only way to know whether a patient has truly outgrown a food allergy. He went into anaphylaxis after the second dose and needed epinephrine, prednisone, and antihistamine to halt the reaction. At age nine, we attempted another oral food challenge. Thomas went into anaphylaxis during the observation period, projectile vomiting in the exam room and breaking out into hives. He has done additional challenges since then, along with 22 endoscopies for the EOE. And although an oral food challenge is the gold standard to diagnose food allergy, it's physically and emotionally traumatizing. We're asking people to eat the very thing that could harm them, and we need more and better options. Thomas is now 18 and living away from home at school in another state. I know he is being his own best advocate, as he always has been. Every family faces different challenges on their food allergy journey. Many are at risk for life-threatening anaphylaxis, underscoring the urgent need for new therapies and diagnostics to accurately diagnose and manage patients living with food allergies. The impact that food allergies have on families, physical and mental health cannot be overstated. We look forward to working with the FDA and pharmaceutical companies as you develop new therapies to save lives and lessen the burdens food allergies cause for families across the country. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists for sharing your voice this morning. Thank you, Eleanor, for, for so nicely capturing the essence of this morning's uh, session. And uh, to all of you in the audience, both here in the room and online, uh, who have shared so far today. So at this point, we're going to take a lunch break. We will resume at uh, 1 15 Eastern time, uh, at which time we will uh, uh, go into our sup second topic of the day, which is to explore your experiences with current treatments 
and discuss your preferences for potential future treatments. So again, thank you, and we'll look forward to seeing you all back uh, in a little bit this afternoon.
Hello, and welcome back to the externally led patient focused drug development meeting on food allergies. My name is James Valentine, and I'm your moderator. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back to our second session for today. Uh, we had such a wonderful uh, dialogue this morning. Uh, you all really dug in deep and helped us understand what it is to live with food allergies, the symptoms and impacts in daily life uh, that you all and your loved ones experience. Uh, this afternoon, we're gonna build on that uh, uh, earlier discussion and now talk about your experiences with treatments. Uh, when we talk about treatments, we mean this in the broadest sense. Uh, we not only are talking about medications or medical procedures, um, but also uh, more broadly in terms of maybe it's uh, more holistic approaches to treatment, uh, it could be lifestyle modifications, of course, uh, diet being uh, an important uh, one of those, and avoidance. Um, really anything that you might do, even lifestyle modifications, that might make living with food allergies a little bit easier. So we want to hear about those things. We want to know the different things you've tried, whether it's something you're currently doing or you've used in the past. Uh, we want to hear how well those things work in helping manage those symptoms and health effects of uh, food allergies that we learned so much about this morning. Um, knowing that no uh, treatment comes without side effects, we want to know, uh, and other downsides, we want to explore also what are the downsides of your existing treatments, whether that is some kind of uh, treatment side effect or perhaps just the burden or other associated challenges of those treatment approaches that you have available to you today. We're gonna wrap up our session uh, looking again towards the future. This time we'll be asking you to weigh in on what your preferences and priorities are for future treatments. Um, we all would want a cure for food allergies, um, but we're gonna ask you to think about short of that cure, what would be a, a meaningful and important uh, next treatment uh, for you or your loved one. So again, to get us started off on our topic, we have a panel of your peers who'll be sharing their uh, experiences and views. Uh, we have Emily, Aaron, Maeve, Priscilla, and Dawn. So I'd like to invite Emily up uh, to get us started. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. My name is Emily Brown. I am the mother of two children who bear a significant burden of allergic disease. I live in Kansas City where I'm a wife, mother, and social entrepreneur. I am the founder and CEO of Food Equality Initiative and Free From Market. Both of my girls are allergic to peanuts and tree nuts. My youngest, Hannah, also has eosinophilic esophagitis, better known as EOE. Our journey began in December of 2012 when I introduced peanut butter for the first time. My oldest daughter, Catherine, was only one. After calling our pediatrician, I administered Benadryl and waited for signs for another flare-up. The Benadryl was effective and stopping the reaction. We went to our local doctor's office that afternoon and Catherine was tested for the top eight common allergens. We were prescribed an EpiPen and told to avoid peanuts. A week later, they would call and leave a voicemail instructing me also to remove milk, eggs, wheat, and soy from Catherine's diet. I was overwhelmed. After requesting a follow-up appointment with our doctor to discuss the food allergies, I was told to find a support group. Over the years, our family has managed multiple food allergies with the addition of asthma, allergic rhinitis, and EOE. One of the greatest challenges has been the burden of food avoidance. The current standard of care for individuals with food allergies is food avoidance. The burden of food avoidance for our family has been, has been steep. The time and effort it takes to shop and read every label every time to avoid accidental exposure is significant. And the additional burden of cost 
food avoidance has been financially challenging for our family. I've experienced this firsthand as a mother with limited resources dependent upon nutrition assistance programs. When Catherine was first diagnosed, we did our best to manage the escalating cost of our grocery bill. The average cost of a gallon of milk in Kansas City is about $4. The non-dairy substitute that was most effective for Catherine cost just over $15 a gallon. This became very difficult for our family to maintain. The markup on gluten-free flour is over 1,000% more than all-purpose flour. I could no longer afford our weekly pancake breakfast. I now only made pancakes for holidays and birthdays. When my husband, a social worker, encouraged me to enroll in the WIC program when I, when I discovered I was expecting our second child, I was disappointed to find many of the foods we needed were not available through the program. After speaking with local and national WIC officials, I was encouraged to go to my local food bank. My local food bank did not have a USDA clean room and regularly repackaged foods that contained common allergens in the open. I was discouraged from accepting food from the food bank. Finally, I went to a local pantry. I stood in line for hours and watched people leave with carts full of food. By the time it was my turn to shop the pantry, the only safe foods available were two potatoes and a jar of salsa. This is what led me to start Food Equality Initiative to address the unmet needs of individuals who must eliminate common foods from their diet for health and wellness who are also experiencing food insecurity. However, the growing movement to integrate social care into health care, I urge the FDA to consider approving innovative solutions that solve for food avoidance. While there are many promising pharmaceutical treatments in the pipeline for food allergies, many continue to rely on food avoidance as a measure of protection for patients. Without an approved solution to address food avoidance, we will continue to see wide disparities in food allergy outcomes based on race and income. I also urge the FDA to take steps to ensure that all new approved drugs meet diversity standards in clinical trials. Like most allergic conditions, food allergy has a significant burden in communities of color. Yet, new and emerging treatments continue to underrepresent communities of color in clinical trials. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erin and I am the parent of a teenager with food allergies. The food allergy community needs three things right now. Accurate and definitive diagnostic tools, accessible therapies with lasting results, and less invasive emergency medicine to combat anaphylaxis. The diagnostic process leaves much to be desired for patients. After experiencing an infancy covered in eczema and gasping from severe asthma, my son was diagnosed with multiple food allergies based on an IgE test done by our pediatrician. We took our results to an allergist who recommended using an oral food challenge to test against several of the allergens on his list. Within a year, my son had tested out of three allergens, soy, wheat, and corn. Was he overdiagnosed to begin with? Oral food challenges are cumbersome. First, the test is long in duration and ours required the constant calming of my active toddler. Secondly, my son had already developed some taste and texture versions that made ingestion an exhausting psychological battle. Third, patients and caregivers can view and experiencing these challenges differently. Now 16, my son is up for another oral food challenge. To my delight, he might outgrow a single tree nut. He's not sure he wants to do it though. Oral food challenges cause a great deal of stress. The idea of consuming a food he's been told to avoid for fear of life-threatening anaphylaxis is unsurprisingly unappealing to him and incredibly anxiety-producing. 
Accurate diagnostics could reduce the need for oral food challenges, overdiagnosis, as well as help direct patients who do have a food allergy towards the correct healthcare pipeline. Patients need lasting therapeutics that go beyond the peanut and are inclusive of those with other atopic conditions. When my son was just two and a half, we attended a lecture from a prominent clinician in food allergy who spoke to us about desensitization. He said he believed this research was so promising it might mean a cure for food allergies. I left feeling hopeful, almost relieved, that my son wouldn't be saddled with this tremendous burden throughout his childhood, that he wouldn't have to navigate his high school, college, and adult world, worlds feeling, fearing that his next bite, next medication, next exposure might kill him. We discussed this exciting news with our amazing allergist who avoided us, who advised us to wait to join later phases of clinical trials. Let them work this out first, he said. Our son also didn't qualify due to his asthma, a common co comorbid condition that can fatally complicate an allergic reaction. Strike one. Around age 11, while still waiting for clinical trials to be inclusive of those with asthma, my son began having difficulty swallowing. After several invasive endoscopies with, coupled with difficult to manage elimination diets, he was diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis, otherwise known as EOE, a second disqualification from most therapies. Strike two. So much for that relief I had felt all those years ago. 14 years later, my son is now in high school, layering his food allergy concerns over the normal turbulence of adolescence, adding food allergy management to the list of things he requires from a good university. The food allergy community needs treatments that are inclusive of those with comorbid conditions. These are our most vulnerable patients. We also need therapies that target multiple food allergies and look to help patients with allergies beyond the peanut. We need accessible therapies that reduce the burden of this disease with lasting results. Our community needs affordable, easy to use medi emergency medication. One night, after finishing his regular meal at a trusted safe restaurant, my son, then 12, began wheezing and feeling nauseous. By the time we got home five minutes later, he could barely speak and was pale. I grabbed my epinephrine auto injector, pulled off the safety cap, evaluated my son one more time and hesitated. Was this anaphylaxis? Would the frightening shot and the association with food allergies cause more psychological damage in its wake? I was looking for skin symptoms, which I learned later do not appear 10% of the time. Was this that time? As my son's pallor turned an unnatural shade of blue, our neighbors, two doctors, came immediately over. Looking for confirmation to use the auto injector, I turned to them. But even they hesitated to use it with concerns over administration and elevated heart rate. Ultimately, we treated his breathing and my son improved, but the takeaway for all of us was clear. Early epinephrine would have been key. If a well-informed food allergy parent could hesitate to use epinephrine when it was needed, the risk is that a lot of others would as well. How could we expect our children, teachers, friends, and caregivers to both recognize the symptoms of an allergic reaction and self-administer epinephrine when two doctors debated if it was needed? The injection-based administration of epinephrine is intimidating and requires training to use. We need less invasive administration of emergency medicine as injectable epinephrine can cause hesitation, which is a barrier to use and a potential danger to patients. Current therapies are heavily based in the prevention and reversal of symptoms in young patients. As my son nears his 17th birthday, he is also nearing the end of a window for effective treatment. His age is fast becoming strike three. Without treatment, my son's age turns his food allergies into a life sentence. We need options for the 26 million adults who live with food allergies. It's time to make food allergy diagnostics more effective and emergency treatment less invasive. We need approved therapies that are wider reaching and longer lasting. Alongside our industry partners, you can make a difference for the 32 million Americans and hundreds of millions of patients worldwide who are handicapped by this burdensome and life-threatening condition. Thank you. My name is Maeve, and I am from Columbus, Ohio. I'm a 29-year-old, lifelong food allergic patient, allergic to peanuts, nuts, dairy, eggs, shellfish, 
and seeds, and my comorbid conditions are asthma and eczema. I've passed several food challenges over the last eight years, but as someone who has been, been deemed too reactive to peanuts, eggs, and dairy, OIT has yet to become a viable option for me. I've passed challenges to pecans, walnuts, beef, and some fish, which has vastly improved the variety of what I can include in my life. I return to this conversation about therapies each time I have a new panel of allergy tests done, but the number of allergies I have, the degree of those allergies, my age, and my activity level has not made me a good candidate. This, interestingly, has never been something that was brought up or offered by allergists, and only after becoming more actively involved as an advocate and speaker within the food allergic community have I come to understand how common this treatment is among my younger uh, peers. As someone who leads a competitively active lifestyle, I've encountered multiple iterations in my life of what's called exercise-induced anaphylaxis, where training or raising my heart rate has tricked my body into thinking that something that was a minor reaction should actually be a larger one, and I have become hospitalized. As someone whose career is in strength and conditioning, therefore requiring high energy and constant movement, as well as someone whose personal athletic career is driven in Olympic weightlifting, managing the potential for exercise-induced anaphylaxis is significant. As a result, in a conversation with an allergist, it was recommended to me that I was not a good candidate for therapies given my history of exercise-induced anaphylaxis and the degree to which I live with a naturally high heart rate. Additionally, managing the inflammation that would naturally come with any type of allergy treatment would be challenging, given the recovery modalities that are needed for a competitive elite athlete. A previous allergist suggested that after passing a food challenge for eggs in baked goods, that I, continue, I could continue to eat such baked goods daily to help improve my specific egg allergic response but I'm unwilling to eat those goods to continue both a healthy lifestyle as well as a competitive lifestyle, and current research has given me no other option. Additionally, it is important to consider that though the focus of food allergic treatment is oriented towards children, those children do grow up, and many do not outgrow or entirely respond to treatment to eliminate food allergies. While schedules for many currently eligible for treatment need to revolve around school and other youth activities, adults living with food allergies with potentially less malleable immune systems would logistically require different treatment schedules to allow for a robust professional career and active lives. If there were more FDA-approved treatment options for me, this would lessen systemic reactions if and when they occur. I would have more opportunity at a life filled with the privileges of living without fearful limitations, which others take for granted. I could confidently shake hands in professional settings without feeling anxious that this person may have eaten something that I could react to. I could have eaten at a table in the cafeteria with my peers as a child. I wouldn't need my fanny pack that has my medication with me at all times. I could travel to events like this without needing to research emergency services and supermarkets in the area to make sure that I could eat safely and easily while traveling. Food allergies have permeated every element of the choices that I've made, the person I've become, and the experiences that I hope to have. Viable treatment to minimize risk of exposure would change every facet of my life and has the potential to change a life-ending accident into an accident of mere discomfort. If asked if I would like to entirely eliminate my food allergies from my life, I surprisingly would say no. Most young adults are changed by one potentially end of life experience. I've had both the privilege and frightening opportunity to experience that over 20 times. And I'm grateful for the perspective that food allergies and these reactions have given me. As an adult with food allergies, I'm constantly asked to leave the room of my own workplace when allergens are present. My food allergies are the butt of jokes from people who feel uncomfortable associating my mortality with something that they take for granted. I've been told that I can't ask the passenger next to me on a flight not to eat nuts. I have been minimized for this experience that is so accepted in children simply because I still have these experiences as an adult. I believe that having navigated these reactions has helped me to understand the need for advocates, both for the advocacy of those who experience overt and accidental discrimination based on their food allergies, as well as more broadly sweeping discrimination of race, gender, and other social markers. 
This understanding of how it feels to have been discriminated against based on this chronic disability has informed my pursuit of my graduate degree in social work and has shaped my perspective that I gratefully have of the world. The plethora of near-death experiences have brought into life light what is critical for the FDA to understand, that we need more treatment options, regardless of age and lifestyle, to lessen the propensity for accidental reactions to fatally impact lives. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Priscilla Hernandez, and I am mom to two amazing boys. Zachy is my nine-year-old who is unbelievably intelligent, loves Spider-Man, and has severe food allergies. Our journey with food allergies began at Zachy's birth. We had our hands full. In addition to his inconsolable cries, the first year of life, Zachy regularly had bloody red cheeks and full body hives from eczema that doctors treated with topical steroids. These steroids came with their issues of often making the area worse before it made it better, along with concerns of long-term effects. At the time, there was no medical correlation between eczema and food allergies. Reflecting back, I realized that there were signs I failed to fully recognize. It wasn't until he was presented with a banana at roughly nine months by my mother that his face instantly turned to hives and his skin became clammy. Then I, as a mother, was certain it had to do with food. Getting an official diagnosis was not easy. I was passed from doctor to allergist to specialist. I was then provided Band-Aid solutions through ointments and creams and heard statements like, he'll probably grow out of it. Eventually, a blood test showed that my little man was very allergic to what I felt was almost everything. I would spend the next years in constant battle to get him accommodated. School was less than easy, but I worked to ensure my son's safety by identifying three safe meals with the school cafeteria. Pasta was his go-to, and breadsticks. One afternoon, his nurse called Zachy, called because Zachy, my six-year-old, thought he had eaten something he was allergic to. The nurse's initial call was with little urgency, saying that she thought everything was OK. The next call escalated quickly. The nurse, with a tone of alarm, asked if I was there yet. I was at home. At that point, all I could hear was my baby screaming and crying in the background. No, I, I don't want to, no. My heart sank, as I was not there to protect him. My son suffered his first anaphylactic reaction to sesame, requiring an epinephrine and a visit to the emergency room. So many questions and feelings resulted that day, especially regarding the epinephrine treatment. What are the long-term effects? Will there be emotional effects from what my son saw as a larger-than-life needle penetrating his skin? And could there be an easier way? Fast forward today, my challenges as a caregiver revolve around the future. What is available and what planning is being put into place to seek a cure to this disabling disease? I worry when Zachy will be a carefree teenager that has the potential of making a fatal mistake by simply eating. I would like to see additional treatments that go beyond peanut with less burden during therapy. We have tried OAT, which involves lots of testing, labs, and heaps of diligence. The goal was to eat the allergy in increments to gradually build a tolerance that, should you stop, results in loss of progress and could result in having to start all the way from the beginning. There is no ending to it, and it is a lifelong management process. You are on, on a constant tightrope. Should you measure the wrong amount of allergen for treatment, the result could turn, quickly turn to anaphylaxis. Needless to say, this puts tons of stress on the already anxious caregiver. Food avoidance requires us buying non-cross-contact items in the supermarket, which is often hard to find, not to mention costly. Even with avoidance, we are at the mercy of accurate labeling. Avoidance comes with multiple setbacks. Exclusion is often the byproduct of this. For my son, it has meant that his limitation to participate in regular activities, such as eating lunch with his friends at school, going to restaurants, and often just feeling like a normal kid. 
Though we're thrilled that sesame will be added as the ninth major allergen soon, it is vital that all ingredients are labeled in order to make safe decisions. We hope to have comparable treatments to the EpiPen available that are far less scary for the recipient and less intimidating for those having to administer it, in addition to more accessible. I also hope for early intervention treatments that offer long-term tolerance without lifelong maintenance, as well as expanded treatment options for food allergies and more rapid approval for other top food allergens. Finally, I hope that the FDA continues to expand their outreach and work with patient advocacy community and trusted messengers like FAIR and FAC. This will help make access more equitable for all with food allergies, especially in urban communities. For my amazing Zaki, expansion of information and more importantly, treatment will mean, mean that his contagious smile will continue to fill whatever room he enters without fear of a basic life function, eating, until his golden years. And as a mom, that's all I can ask for. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dawn, and I live in Kansas City, Kansas. I'm 42 years old and a wife, mother, foster parent, spiritual director, and web desi designer. Eczema, hives, inflammation, and hay fever have always been part of my life. Growing up on a farm in Iowa, it was hard to avoid many allergens. I was embarrassed of my skin and sores. I started allergy shots and antihistamines as a kid, and when my skin got really inflamed, I would go in for a steroid injection or oral prednisone. Sometimes my throat itched when I ate and I took Benadryl. When I was 20, I was still itching a lot, and I tested positive with skin prick and IgE blood test to several foods that I craved and ate regularly. I was diagnosed with severe eczema along with food allergies. I did a strict six-month elimination diet with 10 foods, and my eczema improved drastically. Upon reintroducing the allergic foods now, I couldn't eat even a tiny amount of dairy, eggs, pork, or lamb without my throat swelling. Other foods I was supposed to rotate in my diet so as not to become more allergic to them. This has happened, and now I have more allergies than ever, including wheat, corn, oats, nuts, and shellfish. My allergies continue to change. I can't avoid and rotate everything I should, and the delayed reactions to some foods are sneaky and hard to diagnose. I also have many food sensitivities, which I know are different than allergies, but they are significant to me because they affect my skin, weaken my immune system, and cause inflammation. An ideal treatment would address the food allergies the environmental allergies, and my weakened immune system that contributes to the sensitivities and inflammation. I once did oral immunotherapy with an allergist in Wisconsin. I had three vials to use at home for inhalant antigens, foods, and seasonal allergens. I put antigen drops under my tongue three times per day, precisely. I did this for about a year and it seemed to be working, but then I moved to Kansas City and that treatment wasn't available. I liked doing the treatment at home though. My current preventions and treatments for food and environmental allergies overlap. I take Allegra, Flonase, Cuvar, and Singular, sometimes Zyrtec, and allergy eye drops. If I eat wheat, I'm okay for a while, and then I get boils, which has resulted in several very painful trips to the doctor, followed by antibiotics. I recently tried mirtazapine as needed for nighttime itching. It did help the itching, but I couldn't deal with sleeping an extra hour and then still feeling groggy and very emotional. I don't like the idea of being on an antidepressant as an eczema treatment caused by food allergies. I carry Benadryl, albuterol, and an EpiPen every time I go out, especially if I might be eating. I usually don't eat out, and I avoid places where eggs are being cooked. I still get environmental allergy shots, 
I do the careful skincare regimen for eczema. My allergist is trying to get me approved for Dupixent for eczema, um, but I have to try and fail at other treatments first in order to get it covered. This includes steroid creams and now cyclosporine, which is an immunosuppressant drug and seems extreme as a roundabout allergy treatment. I would like to do treatments with less side effects and ones that are actually targeting the allergic problem rather than bandaging allergic symptoms. Even with all of these treatments, I'm still highly allergic with the total IgE hovering around 2000 IU per milliliter. All of these allergies wear on me, making my body constantly tired and stiff, and they affect my family. All three of my children are around the fifth percentile in weight because they eat like I do. This year, I started to see a naturopath who helps me with diet and supplements to increase my energy and help my overall well-being. Living with multiple allergies is stressful, but I'm hopeful. I ask the FDA to consider res more research into allergy prevention and treatments that address the whole person and the relationship between food allergies and other allergic diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn, and to the entire panel. Another incredible panel and really uh, appreciate your sharing your whole journey with the different approaches to treatment, uh, many that you've tried or you've considered, um, and of course sharing what you're looking for in future treatments. So again, another round of applause for our amazing panel. So now we have our second opportunity to expand this discussion to all of you in the audience here in the room, as well as all of you who have been uh, tuning in uh, with us live all day today. Um, I'll do our shout out for those of you who are on the web, our, our individuals living with food allergies and their caregivers. You know, if you want to share uh, your exp experiences with treatments, please go ahead and you can start calling in now, 1-703-844-3231. Again, that's 1-703-844-3231. So what we want to do as part of this uh, exploration of treatment options is start with one very specific treatment approach, and we've already heard a bit about it today, and that's epinephrine. So we kind of want to tackle that first, and then we'll move into some of the other treatment approaches. So to get us started on this topic, uh, let's go back to our polling. So uh, again, pull out your phones, uh, open up that tab. Uh, if you're following along online, you might have opened a tab on your computer. Go to pollev.com forward slash food allergy, and we'll be working through some polling questions throughout this afternoon session, so you can just keep that open and we'll come back to that. So if we can go to our first polling session for this afternoon, here we wanna ask you, have you or your loved one ever been prescribed an epinephrine auto injector? Um, here are some of those listed here, uh, or an epinephrine injection kit, uh, whether prescription or generic. Um, and the options here are yes, you currently have epinephrine. Yes, you have epinephrine, but it's expired. Yes, you've received a prescription for epinephrine, but the prescription has not been filled. No, you've never been prescribed epinephrine. You don't know whether you've, uh, you or your loved one's been prescribed epinephrine, or uh, you have not heard of epinephrine. So please select the response that most closely reflects you and your loved one's experience with epinephrine, whether that's the auto injector or the injection kit. We'll let any other uh, additional responses come in. Uh, however, as it stands, uh, the vast uh, majority of our audience uh, has been prescribed epinephrine and they currently have uh, what we'll say unexpired epinephrine. Although we see a little under, uh, somewhere between five and 10% percent, percent, uh, have epinephrine, but it's expired. And we also see uh, a little over 5% have never been prescribed epinephrine no one reports that they have a prescription that's not been filled uh, or that they are uh, don't know whether they've had a prescription or have not heard of epinephrine. So 
Um, we're going to want to hear, regardless of which category you fit into, your experiences, and uh, not only with um, having gotten a prescription, but your uh, experiences with, with use of epinephrine. And that takes us to our second polling question. So here we want to know, do any of the following pose issues for you or your loved one when it comes to carrying epinephrine auto-injectors? And here we want you to select all that apply. Is, uh, the options are, it is inconvenient or difficult to carry. It is required to be kept in one place. For example, school will not allow it to be taken home. <clears throat> it is kept at home and do, you do not travel with it. You have never had a serious reaction. You only carry it around food. You are afraid to use it. You don't know how to use it. You forget it or it is not allowed everywhere that you go. So please select all of those responses that apply to you and your loved one when it comes to carrying your epinephrine auto injector, of course, uh, if you have one. And as you're thinking about these responses and picking the options, um, we're, we want you to think about what these scenarios are where some of these issues arise and what these issues mean for you and your loved ones uh, as part of everyday life. So as a reminder, we'll do this uh, once for the afternoon since there are response options uh, or our respondents can select more than one response option. The percentages you're seeing are the percentage of responses, not the percentage of people picking each response. So these uh, bars are essentially a, a bit of a ranking. And so what we see is the kind of top so, uh, selected issue faced by our audience today is that it is inconvenient or difficult to carry their epinephrine auto injector. Uh, we see then, uh, uh, you know, number two being that they forget to carry, forget to take it or carry it. Uh, and, and close after that is number three, they're afraid to use it. Um, however, we see responses really across the board here, many of these issues, and there actually may be other issues um, related to carrying your, your auto injector uh, that you may want to share. So now uh, we're gonna bring the rest of you into this discussion. We wanna hear your experiences, um, whether that's uh, a good experience, a bad experience, maybe it's mixed, um, but with the use of uh, epi, EpiPens, uh, epinephrine auto injectors. Yes, we have a comment here, Charmaine. Hi, I'm Charmaine Anderson. I live here actually in Maryland, right around the corner in Laurel. So I have two daughters who have food allergies. One has just finished college, one is just starting college. Um, and the one that's in college currently is my one has the, the most extreme, I would say, of food allergies. Every type of nut, mm. sesame, hummus, you name it, she's allergic to it. Um, so the one thing I mentioned actually, you know, shortly before we were taking her to school and even just a couple days ago, I said, have you had the conversation with your sweet mates? Cause she's in a suite with five, four other girls about your food allergy. And she said, yes, mom. I said, more importantly, have you explained to them and shown them how to utilize your EpiPen? <laughs> and she said, yes, mom. And I said, is everybody good? And she said, well, you know, to the point of a lot of them are a little skittish about it. Um, and so, you know, certainly I can see just even in the course of her having to carry an epinephrine auto injector, which she actually carries three on her at all times, about just the utilization of it and just, you know, again, her peers, who I think one of the young ladies mentioned, just, you know, you have to have this circle of folks that are gonna be kind of the lookout for you, even particularly if you can't help treat yourself. Um, so I do think just the, you know, the usage of the needle, it does draw fear in not only the patient, but more importantly, the people around them. And certainly for her as a young adult, <laughs> she would be opened arms to anything but having to stick a needle in her leg, right? Um, and even for my older daughter, who's just finished college, she was the one that wouldn't carry it around with her. Because A, it was mom, you know, it's in the way, or mom, it's, you know, People don't, you know, not everybody has a food allergy. I only use it when I need it. Of course, me, the mom, you know, freaking out because she's not wanting to keep this thing on her person. 
but it was just, sorry, two very extremes of just kind of the nature of dealing with young adults <laughs> um, and how they perceive just life moving into this food allergy space, but more importantly, how they think of their peers and how they kind of want to fit in in some respects. Um, again, so just the different nature of the beast of kind of carrying this object. And I grew up with asthma my whole entire life and having to keep an inhaler on me is very cumbersome. And so I get it of not wanting to always have that EpiPen on you because again, where are you gonna put it? Where's it gonna be? Just, you know, so all those things come into play. So certainly if there were different types of treatment options available, I think at least from that young adult perspective, they would be hands up first in line. So that's my two cents on that. Yeah, well, I have a couple of follow-up questions sure. for you, if you don't mind. Please. Um, so first, maybe starting with your younger daughter, you said she carries three pens. Can you just talk a little bit about why that because, is? Because you know we've had incidences, and interestingly enough, both my girls, we didn't really catch that they had like really bad food allergies until they grew up, kind of got older. When okay. they were younger, it was kind of like, eh, you know, nothing really that was like, whoa, where they had some type of anaphylactic episode. But as they grew into like their older teenage years, things started progressing a little more. Like especially my youngest one who, you know, full on anaphylactic where, you know, the swelling and the shortness of breath and the hives and the vomiting. Um, and each kind of time it got worse. And so for her, I think it's just her own mental sense of just security. Like, okay, one might not work, two might not work. And if I get to the third one, even though I'm gonna use it, I've gotta to get to the, doc, you know, to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I think for her mentally, it's just, a, it's like a security blanket. Cause she's had those episodes where it's just like, it's each time it kind of gets worse. Yeah. So she just wants to feel like in her own sense that she's fully prepared. And meanwhile, my other one who should be carrying her epinephrine auto injector with her, hers aren't as severe. Mm. So for her, it's like, oh, I'll pop a Benadryl and I'll be good. And you know, she's never really found where she's had to use her mm. epinephrine auto injector, where my younger one has. And you know, we've sure. had to kind of, you know, full on, you know, everybody on deck get the epinephrine and you know put it in her. So I think that's again to the nature of just why she feels like she needs to carry so many with her. And sure. and mind you. I bet you two of them are currently, you know, not expired. The third one probably is expired, but again, it's just her own subconscious of wanting to feel safe. Yes, and, and has she ever been in a situation, your younger daughter, where um, you talked about, you know, uh, her uh, bunk mates, you know, being able to use it. Has she ever been in a situation where someone outside of, you know, the immediate family has ha had to help and, and use No, it? she has not. Um, and again, this is, you know, the, this, and then with now her away in college, she's six hours away. And so just as a parent, I'm like, okay, I need everybody to know. And mind you, even when my first daughter went off to college, you know, we made sure we knew who the food service people were. We had, we did the meeting, right? This is what she's allergic to. Where can she dine? Because, you know, certain cafeterias had certain food choices and things like that. So we kind of came in with that lens already. Mm -hmm. um, so again, just knowing now that this particular daughter is much further away at school, I just wanted to make sure like, you know, again, make sure everybody knows <laughs> we've done this already through the college experience, but now let's do even more because I knew her reactions were much different than my other daughter who had gone to college. Sure. Well, thank you so much sure. for sharing all of that. Other experience with EpiPens and epinephrine. Yes, Tanya. Hi, Tanya Winders. I'm the mom of a 16-year-old Carson with peanut and tree nut allergies. Um, the, the comment I wanted to make is in our situation, Carson has not anaphylaxed since she was two years old. So she honestly has zero memory of that moment mm. and of that day. And what I have found is that the further we are away from that anaphylactic event, to be honest, the more cavalier we become. Um, and I know that's not the right thing. I know it's not probably the safest thing, but it is the reality. As a human being, we normalize, we adapt, we carry on, and we just aren't as vigilant as we once were. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of this in regard to carrying uh, your epinephrine auto injectors, and especially both of them in Carson's case, 
is the convenience, the cool factor, the not wanting people to know that she's different, all of those psychosocial aspects of living with food allergy. But it also is, you know, she's like, Mom, this is a medicine that I've carried for years and never had to use. There's, an, I mean, what other condition do you purchase a medication that you never have to use or you hope you never have to use? Mm -hmm. And in her case, it's been, as I said, you know, 14 years so since we've had to use epinephrine. And so I, I just think that there are a lot of factors like that in our own experience that are impacting um, the conversations that I have with her about the importance of still mm -hmm. carrying epinephrine even 14 years post her last reaction, severe reaction. Yeah, and so just maybe to give us a sense of her current experience then with her food allergies, does she have you know, any reactions? You know, what is kind of her current level of, of, of burden? Yeah, so she's peanut tree nut allergic, and she has not she she has an aversion, you know, and, and so really has never eaten them, doesn't like them, and her accidental exposures have been minimal. She's maybe had a little bit of hives, a little bit of tingling, but never full anaphylaxis in the last 14 years. And so she really has been safe and aware and prepared. Um, but as we are getting into these teenage and young adult years, I, I, I've walked in and seen the epinephrine sitting in her bedroom rather than in on her person or I've seen it in the glove box of the car when she's you know off to a party or something so um, you know that's just the reality of, of teaching your teenagers to self-manage right. and the importance again of having a medication that they hope they never have to use absolutely thank you Tanya yes we'll come work our way forward here so Aaron to piggyback on what um, Charmaine and Tanya both said, um, not only is it difficult to carry, I think it's most especially difficult to carry for men. It's a bulky item. It requires them to maybe carry extra baggage or fanny packs or other items on them, which they may not already be used mm -hmm. to carrying. Um, I think a lot of people also forget that epinephrine is um, sensitive to temperature. And so it doesn't travel very well. It doesn't do great in these hot summer months that we've do had. It doesn't do so great in the cold months. Um, the injector itself, the mechanisms can misfire under those kind of stringent conditions, um, even when the medication itself holds stable. So it's more complicated even than just the carrying part, which is super inconvenient. It's also this other factor of we need to temperature control it when we carry. So you can imagine a lot of us in these last three months over the summer have been carrying it in coolers or in cooler bags or trying to keep it you know, in the winter and keep it warm in a car, which means it's not close to where you are. Um, so there can be a lot of other little complications when it comes to carrying. It's a little imperfect as a medicine itself. Yeah, so maybe, you know, you mentioned a few different um, kind of downsides of, of the, you know, the, the treatment. Um, you know, how does that then translate to impacts in daily life? For example, carrying, needing to carry a cooler or, you know, opting to perhaps not carry at that time to avoid or, or leaving it in a car somewhere away from you. Do you have it, any experiences to share there? Of course, it simply makes everything a lot more difficult. Yeah. It means that when you have a day at the beach, you have to pack a cooler for your epinephrine, but it can't be too cold, mm. but also can't be too hot. So you have to figure out a way to keep it temperature controlled to room temperature while you're in the hot sun. If you live somewhere where it's consistently like that, like in the Southwest, for example, that could be a major problem. It could also be a major problem when you do outdoor activities. If you're hiking or skiing or sledding or just having a day outdoors, those cold temperatures could also be equally difficult. And you have to figure out a way to manage that and keep it warm against your body potentially. That also can be cumbersome and inhibit the way you move or the way you operate or the way you enjoy sure. your act outdoor activities. Um, and when it comes to living at the car, a lot of people do that. And we all probably have done it once in a while by accident or on purpose, thinking that you don't need it. But epinephrine doesn't help you unless it's with you. Mm -hmm. um, those extra minutes it takes to go to a car and then to use it could be the minutes you need to save your life mm -hmm. or to the minutes you need to buy yourself time before the ambulance comes. And we, by the way, always hope that ambulances carry epinephrine and they don't always carry epinephrine. It's another layer of problem that we can discuss, but yeah. not every ambulance comes equipped with that and ready to go. Um, so you need that epinephrine on you and those extra minutes it takes to go to a parking lot and get it out of your car could be the difference between um, you know, recovering very quickly and requiring a, a lot more intervention. Sure, thank you so much, Aaron. Yes, Lisa. 
right behind you, Lisa. So one of the challenges that a lot of us just spoke about was the, the needle phobia. And my daughter has had multiple anaphylactic reactions, some of them to her OIT doses, some of them <coughs> to finding out new allergens. Um, when she was four, we had to use epinephrine and the needle bent and got stuck in her leg. Mm. So here is a four-year-old. She had had anaphylaxis prior to that in her life, but this was probably the first time that she would really remember that reaction and the treatment of that reaction. And I had a needle that I literally had to pull out of her leg after administration of it and then wonder, did it administer the medicine? I don't know, right? So that was kind of her first experience sure. of remembering anaphylaxis. And the next time she needed an epinephrine, she begged me not to give it to her. And I obviously had to and did. And now we've unfortunately experienced it so many times that I make her self-administer for the practice of it if needed because of that fear, right? Like we're afraid as parents to give it mm -hmm. and we expect our teenagers, if they carry it even, as Tanya said, to give it to themselves or have their friends give it. And that is, as Aaron said earlier, that is one of our biggest barriers is that treatment of epinephrine auto injectors the way they currently exist. Sure, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Any final comments or thoughts on epinephrine? We're gonna broaden it to other treatment approaches, but know that this is an important topic for this community. All right, so let's do so. I wanna make sure our, we have some people on the phone in the queue who wanna talk about some other treatment approaches. We do have you, we will get to that um, now as we're broadening the discussion, but first we're gonna to go to a couple of polling questions. Um, so go ahead and take the, grab your phones, go to that tab, go to polyv.com forward slash food allergy, and we're gonna take a look here at our polling question. So here we wanna know what treatment or management strategies have you used for food allergy? And here we want you to select all that apply. The options are oral uh, immunotherapy, epicutaneous immunotherapy, sublingual immunotherapy, probiotic or microbiome treatment, food avoidance, or some other treatment or management strategy um, that you've used for your food allergy that's not listed uh, here on this slide. So we'll give you just another moment to get your responses in here. Um, as it stands, it, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, um, the, the top treatment or management strategy is food avoidance. Um, we've heard a lot about that today, but we wanna continue that discussion, understanding where, where it works, where it doesn't. Um, we see here that we do have experience, both in the room and online, with uh, the various immunotherapy approaches, uh, as well as probiotic and microbiome treatment as well as other things, and we want to encourage you to please um, share your other treatment experiences. Uh, maybe it's something that's not as commonly used, that's okay. We want to hear what uh, works and what doesn't uh, from your perspectives. So let's move to uh, one more polling question on this uh, topic as we're moving to think about your overall treatment approach. Here we want to know how well does your or your loved one's current management strategy, so thinking about all of these things in combination, prevent reactions due to accidental exposure? Not at all, very little, somewhat, to a great extent, completely, or not applicable because you're not using any strategy. So please select the response that most closely reflects how you view your, you or your loved one's current management strategy helping prevent reactions due to accidental exposure. And regardless of which one of these you pick, we're gonna ask you to explain what, that, what you're using and, and how you view uh, your experience fitting into that particular category. 
As it stands, it looks like we've got a little uh, under two thirds of the audience uh, who says that their management strategies uh, prevent reactions to a great extent. We see a, a little under a third saying that they prevent reactions somewhat, uh, and under ten, a little under 10% saying they actually prevent uh, reactions completely. No one reports that their strategies do not prevent reactions at all, or only very little, and no one reports not using any strategy. So I actually wanna start this uh, call with a uh, phone, or this discussion with a caller. Um, actually, I think this is this, perhaps the same caller we started with our discussion in the morning. We have Thomas from New York, um, and he wanted to talk about um, his son's situations and, and talking about some perspectives on OIT. So I wanna uh, see, do we have Thomas with us? Hi, this is Thomas speaking. Hi, Thomas. Uh, welcome back. Would uh, love to hear your uh, the, ex the treatment experiences you wanted to share. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, first to address, I think um, many know that my youngest son Elijah had passed away due to food allergies in 2017 on November 3rd, and that experience, in terms of impact, has changed the trajectory of my family's life and how we look at things and look at how we view the food allergy world. And to kind of like, um, kind of like take a few steps back, there were times that we were um, offered, you know, to try OIT treatment of both Sebastian and Elijah. But when we look at the accessibility, the care, or the accessibility of the treatment, you know, although we were middle class, but we were also faced with financial hardship in terms of like trying to provide this outside of the scope of our current insurance. So when we're on Medicaid and you have to see a specific specialist that, um, that tailors to your child's allergies and work with OIT, that's a big out of pocket expense. And, you know, so we had to kind of like put that to the side, but then fast forward and after, you know, the past of my son Elijah still offered the treatment for my son Sebastian to try OIT, but due to what happened, um, it, it was, it was kind of uh, something I didn't want to put my son um, Sebastian in trying OIT. I'm not knocking the treatment. It's been beneficial to so many people today and it's helped them live um, a better life. But, you know, it's just, it's just something I don't, I don't see as a part of a regimen right now for my son, but also when he turned comes to access of care in terms of families who need specific specialties in underserved communities of people who can't afford these types of treatment, you know, social socioeconomical factors plays a big role in that. So how do we get this access to care to communities that, you know, that need it and are underrepresented, especially when it comes to getting epinephrine and auto injectors, they can't afford these types of access to treatment or these access to specialists because they're huge out of pocket expense and costs. So, you know, it's, you know, how do we develop health promotion, health strategies in terms of bringing this type of care to the communities? Yeah. So, Thomas, um, one thing that you said kind of stood out, and that's, you know, that you, you see the opportunity, the potential benefits of, of OAT, but you're not there yet, or you're, you're you know, Sebastian's not there yet. Um, can you explain maybe, you know, would there be a situation where, um, you know, the, the time is right or the, the, you would view the benefits outweighing the risks of uh, OIT? Um, personally, I, would, I don't see as a time being right um, because I'm still dealing with the loss of my youngest son, <clears throat> um, my, my youngest son, Elijah. So having him in treatment, and I know the risk that comes with OIT treatment. So I kind of like geared in terms of opting out of those type of treatments. It may be something for him as he gets older, if he's more in, inclined to doing it, as he's more mindful about what's going on. And is this something he wants to do to better, to better his lifestyle as he gets older as an adult? But currently from my wife and I, this is not something we see as, as, um, as a form of treatment for him right now, just based on, uh, it's almost, it'll be too traumatic if he happens to have an, alert, uh, an anaphylactic reaction during the treatment. Right. 
No, that makes sense. Thank you so much, Thomas, for, for sharing um, your, your, uh, both of your son's experiences and how that's impacting uh, Sebastian's uh, you know, own fears around OIT. Appreciate that. I see we have another caller, uh, Shannon from California, um, that wants to share her son's uh, experience actually in a clinical trial. And of course, clinical trials are certainly part of uh, approaches to treatment. You know, when, when you don't uh, have adequate approved treatments, you look to clinical trials as a, another potential opportunity uh, for yourself or for your loved one, which of course helps uh, advance the greater good as well. Um, but want to hear about this trial experience from Shannon. Um, are you with us? I am here. Can you hear me? I, uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Shannon, and I have a son who's multiple food allergic. Uh, we found out very, very young that he's highly allergic to dairy. Um, dairy has always been something very challenging for my family, as you might imagine. When we were getting ready to send my son off, to uh, public school, we realized that it's unavoidable. We have to figure out how to do this with milk. My son was so allergic to dairy that if he even got a little touch on his skin, he would develop hives. So at the time, we were living in Chicago, and we were so excited that DBV offered a milk patch clinical trial at the hospital. Our wonderful allergist thought that my son would be a great candidate. He was seven, and so we went for it. Um, in order to participate, he had to prove that he's actually IgE anaphylaxis to dairy. So you might imagine that wasn't the best day of our lives. Um, he had made it through the first dose, and by the second dose, it was very clear that he went into anaphylaxis, and we used the epinephrine in an emergency situation. What I didn't expect is that um, over time, not only did that scary anaphylaxis situation remind us why we need to be so vigilant. It also helped my son realize that epinephrine works. Like a previous speaker spoke earlier, he had it had been so long since he had went into anaphylaxis that I don't even think he knew the real symptoms, and I don't think he realized how quickly epinephrine works. So that became a very positive experience for him. We participated for the first two years. We were really excited. We saw a lot of um, growth. He did have to take the, take it very seriously and eat and consume, excuse me, dairy to see how far we, we would go after being on it for two years, and he made it very far. The nurse actually had to tell me, Shannon, we have to stop. He's starting to show a reaction, and I didn't believe her. I thought it was actually the placebo day. Um, that said, we were asked to do another two years, which we did. My son developed wonderful friendships with the team. Um, he himself became felt very a lot of pride to help his food allergic community and our friends. And then the pandemic hit, and we were set to do the final oral challenge, and the, we had to not participate because the hospital wasn't allowing it at the time, and our life then moved us to California. So we don't really know the end result of my son's participation with DBV milk patch, but as far as how far he got with milk. But what I do know is that it tremendously helped him socially, emotionally. He was once so afraid to be around dairy, but once we were able to remind him that, hey, you have dairy on your back 24 hours a day and you are not going into anaphylaxis, it really eased a lot of anxiety for him. And it really provided him a lot of um, hope and self-empowerment that he could not only help himself, but also see if this was a potential treatment as not as non-invasive as OIT that might help some of his friends and, and uh, our community members. Yeah, and have, uh, Shannon, did you already see any of those kind of the, that translation, um, you know, kind of not maybe being uh, so fearful or, you know, appropriately cautious, um, you know, of accidental exposure, you know, what did that mean, you know, for his life, his social life, school life? Yeah, it, you know, it, he's now the kid that I sometimes don't remind, I never have to remind him to wear his epinephrine. He, he likes to wear it everywhere he goes. Um, he's very responsible to, to bring it with him because he knows that it works. Um, he is like a, his own food allergy advocate, so he enjoys meeting other kids and saying, we can do this, you know, this is how we live. Um, and the anxiety, it's, it's very healthy. He still gets very nervous around pizza Mm -hmm. and milk, but it's not what it was, which was, he was really avoidant. So it, it did improve a lot of his social emotional needs. 
in his development in an early age. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Shannon, for, for calling and sharing that. I want to look here to our room. You know, so we've moved on from focusing just on epinephrine. There's a whole range of other treatment approaches. Um, we're looking, you know, uh, to, to hear your experiences. You know, is anything that you've tried helped? Um, you know, whether that's, you know, one of the immunotherapies, whether that's, you know, some, you know, lifestyle modification that you've made uh, that has just really helped maybe, maybe in terms of the avoidance. Um, you know, we're kind of casting a wide net here. Lisa? Yay. Um, so yeah, I've had a lot of experience. Um, my son did OIT for dairy. Um, and at the same time, my daughter did OIT for peanut. Um, they're three years apart. So I figured, well, you know, at least they'll be in it together. Two completely different experiences. Um, my son, when we started it, was five and a half at the time. Um, he went through it, you know, all the doses over time, reached his maintenance dose, and he now drinks a cup of milk for maintenance every single day. Mm -hmm. I have to bribe him, but that's okay. Um, it is a lifelong commitment. It is a lot of driving for where we went. It is a lot of time commitment. You know, how do you keep a six-year-old still after two hours after dosing, still to this day, he is now seven, and I have to say, don't raise your heart rate a half hour before. What time are we gonna do it? I can't send you to school having done it within two hours. So it's a lot, it's still a lot. Yes. Unfortunately, my daughter had a very different experience to the point where she had 10 anaphylactic reactions over a year and a half of trying to updose and didn't get very far. She won't eat now. So now I'm at the point with my 10-year-old that I am trying to find the right behavioral health program for her because she's not, not eating because she doesn't want to gain weight. She's not eating because she is terrified to. So can you help me understand that when you say she's not eating, so she's not eating not just things that are, you know, clearly include the allergen, but even more broadly, she's kind of has this now aversion to just eating generally? Sure. So she's always been that typical picky eater kid. You know, we were in a feeding team when she was a baby, things like mm -hmm. that. But n during our course of OIT, she actually had added two foods that had been previously safe for her. Mm -hmm. She ingested them and had anaphylaxis to them. Mm -hmm. So she now does not trust things that were once safe for her. She's had experience now of anaphylaxis too. So how do I know that the next thing she tries, you know, how does she know the next thing she tries isn't gonna cause anaphylaxis? And right. you know, she was home when, they ha when those reactions happened. So how can she trust me if I say, well, you've eaten them 50 times before and she'll turn to me and go, yeah, and I, the 51st time, you had to give me two EpiPens after, mm -hmm. right? So we're really trying to find the right behavioral health clinician who understands food allergies as well as like avoidant restrictive food intake yeah. um, disorders because it's, a you know, how do you, you can't say it's an irrational fear to be afraid of food when you've experienced right. the trauma that she's experienced. Is that having nutritional impacts on her? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it ha has a nutritional impacts. She's Petite, my almost se my seven year old um, is just about the same height as her and outweighs her by twenty pounds. Yeah, yeah. And and then so for your son on the positive side, you know what has that translated to? Obviously, there's you talked about the maintenance, but you know presumably that's giving him some protection. Sure. What is that has that meant in his life? So that has been life changing for in a positive for sure. Um, as someone mentioned before, pizza is at every kid's birthday party, so just in terms of my own anxiety, he can go even if he doesn't eat it there because right. a lot of times he doesn't want to eat it when he's out because he is still nervous about it. Sure. Um, that just allows him to go and, and enjoy that piece of it a little more without the worry. You know, mm -hmm. he does still have multiple other food allergies, so we're still managing egg and, and others um, non top nine. So, you know, it's not that he's uh, free and clear, but it just, it really spoke volumes to me as a parent to see they both went into it the same time. And in right. my mind, I was like, okay, you know, there might be some bumps along the way, but the drastic differences, it's heartbreaking to me in some ways too, right? It's great sure. hope for my son and it has opened fantastic doors and experiences for him, but it's also 
really, really traumatized my daughter and myself, mm -hmm. right? So it's hard. And as a food allergic adult, I will tell you now, I couldn't, after watching what she went through, I couldn't do it myself as a treatment option. Right. There needs to be more, you know, less risky options. Yes. And one sure. final clarifying question. Sure. So in your son's experience, is it helped in that he doesn't have to worry about the accidental exposure or would he actually in the maybe a different setting eat a piece of pizza? So he can um, eat ad lib. Um, he, he is cleared for that for his dairy. Okay. Um, so he will eat it at home. He will not eat it outside of the home. He doesn't feel comfortable that he can manage it yet himself. And sure. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, that but yeah. It's yeah. good to know. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Thank you. So much for sharing. Yep. Yes. We'll come to Andrea first, and then we'll go to Carrie with some written comments. Andrea from Salt Lake City. So one of the things we talked about was avoidance, but it's really not that easy. And people say, well, you know, just don't eat seafood. And I have a 26-year-old son that's allergic to tree nuts. Well, just don't eat tree nuts. Um, but people don't quite understand. No matter how many precautions we take, cross-contact occurs, people don't think it's serious. They think maybe we're just picky and don't like nuts. And there have been multiple times that we've gone to different banquets or things pre-COVID uh, that we RSVP'd, let them know what our food allergies were, scanned the menu when the menu came. Food allergies were not listed on there, but then there were nuts on the salad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, luckily my son hadn't ingested the nut. He had ingested a piece of the lettuce, so the reaction wasn't as severe. But we've had countless problems with that in, in restaurants where there's cross-contact. and. And I'm thinking, okay, do, these people have to have a food handler card. There has to be a food safety manager on staff. Are they not covering food allergies during the training? Are they just talking about cold holding temperatures and the hot holding temperatures? Um, it's really, really hard to trust anyone. And it's not just restaurants. It's family members. It's neighborhood cookouts. Um, I won't even use a grill and other than our own grill because I don't know if someone has cooked salmon on the grill. Um, so to really, so trust is, is really hard. And I, I think probably all of us in the room, I see a lot of people shaking their heads. Trust is really hard because this isn't just that we're picky. This is life and death mm -hmm. that from when we ingest something to death can be 30 minutes. And I don't think the food service staff understands that. I don't think neighbors understand that. We've even had family members that kept forgetting that my son had a tree nut allergy. Right. So that's really prevention and, and avoidance isn't as easy as it sounds. We've tried that for decades. Yeah. So that's really difficult. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, not despite best efforts, you know, there's, it, you know, you can't, your best efforts to avoid doesn't mean that it's not eventually going to make it through, you know, to the food that you're eating. So. Right. And we trust these people to keep yeah. us safe and they fail no matter how many precautions we take. So it's very scary. Very. Um, I do want to take one more phone caller, then we're going to, uh, well, I'm sorry, Carrie first, actually. Uh, we do have comments coming in from the web, so I want to make sure we capture some of those. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to read two comments, um, written comments from people who are joining us online. The first is from Kim from Oakland, California, who says, we are very fortunate to live in an area that has multiple OIT providers and the ability to fit this into our schedule, though challenging from a time commitment perspective. Our older son has successfully undergone OIT for egg and is slowly working on sesame and tree nuts. Egg OIT has been life changing and that he can now eat many foods kids love at celebrations, ice cream, cake, etc. But it is a significant commitment. He has to eat scrambled egg every day, which he dislikes. Sesame nut OIT has been very slow going. The constraints around dosing are also very challenging. Asking an active sports loving elementary school age boy to have a rest period for two hours before and two hours after dosing is nearly impossible. Yeah. Um, we have one more comment from Leanne from Livingston, New Jersey, who says that her son Joshua was one of the first participants in the COFAR 6 study out of Mount Sinai in New York City. He began wearing the um, Baskin pa peanut patch when he was just eight years old. And at the age of 16, he is still wearing it via the FDA Compassionate Use Program. As a tennis player who practices seven days a week, doing OIT was not an option he would even consider. 
We were so grateful that the patch was a treatment that allowed him to continue to pursue his passion. The only side effect Joss experienced was minor skin irritation at the patch site, which decreased over time. No issues wearing the patch, even when swimming. I am aware that the patch isn't a cure. Josh will continue to avoid peanut products and is still mindful about accepting food that could be unsafe. We think of life as BP and AP, before and after peanut patch. Our quality of life has improved so much. This is an option all families who have a child with peanut allergy deserve to have as an FDA approved treatment. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you for all of you who have written in with comments. We encourage you to continue sending in those comments. Again, that form is under the live stream on the web page today that you're following along on. Uh, you can continue to submit those. And then as a general reminder, we'll be able to continue collecting comments for 30 days even after today's meeting. And they'll get included in that voice of the patient report. Um, so we've been talking about treatment approaches, things that have helped. Um, as I had mentioned, we know that there's the flip side to that. And of course, we've already started uh, talking about that topic, which is the downsides of the treatment approaches that you have available to you. Um, but to get us uh, thinking about this topic, we're gonna go to a polling question. So please go ahead and pull out your phones, open that tab in your browser, go to pollev.com forward slash food allergy. Uh, and we're gonna, uh, we have a polling question for you on treatment downsides. So here we're asking you to please indicate any reasons that make you hesitant to undergo any current or future food allergy treatments. So this is not specific to any particular treatment. We want you to think kind of generally about your uh, preferences for treatments. And so here we want you to select the top three. So again, these are the reasons that would make you hesitant to undergo a treatment, whether it's a current one or some future treatment. The options are it's too time consuming, the risks of potential reaction outweigh any benefits. You do not have transportation for weekly or monthly doctor's visits. You're unable to miss work for weekly or monthly doctor's visits. You do not believe it will work or you, would, uh, or you don't trust it. It has not been offered or recommended by your doctor. It may be too expensive or not covered by your insurance. You will not want to eat the food. This is of course for food-based treatments. It is too restrictive. For example, requires periods of rest or lifestyle changes uh, to a company. Uh, too anxious about adverse reactions. Uh, maybe a family, uh, a friend or a family member had a negative experience with the treatment that has impacted your views of it. Uh, it doesn't easily accommodate or treat your multiple allergies. That would be an important factor for you. Or some other reason that's not listed here that would make you hesitant to undergo a current or future food allergy treatment. And again, you're trying to Pick the top three. Um, so pick up to three options here of what would make you hesitant to undergo a treatment. So while any final responses are coming in as it stands, it looks like the top reason that would make you hesitant to undergo a treatment is that it's too time consuming. Um, after that, it looks like uh, risks of potential reaction uh, would make you hesitant or that it's too restrictive. Um, we also see some other leading responses that it's, you're too anxious about adverse reactions or that it wouldn't treat or accommodate multiple allergies. Um, you see many of these different uh, hesitancies uh, in many top three. Some that are not listed in the top three for anyone are that uh, you would not have transportation for the visits um, or if a friend or family member had a negative experiment, uh, experience to the treatment. We do have some people reporting other, so we want to hear about what those are. So this is the time where I'm going to ask you why. <laughs> you know, when you're thinking about this and you made your responses, why did you pick what you picked? So I'm gonna throw it back out to our audience here, thinking about treatments. Um, maybe this is informed and uh, you actually have experienced one of these things with a current treatment. We wanna hear about those experiences too, so not just hypothetical. Yeah, Andrea? 
Okay, you're stuck listening to me again. Um, so with our family, with our history of allergies and asthma, so I'd asked my son if he wanted to look into this, and um, he said, Mom, you know, I already did allergy shots for five years, you know, twice a week for five years. He could never even get to the maintenance dose, and then on top of that, he was on a biologic to treat his severe asthma. Mm -hmm. um, he was in the hospital eight times, ICU twice for asthma. It was usually um, caused by pneumonia or the wildfire smoke. So for him, a lot of his growing up years were in a doctor's office. Um, and same thing with allergy shots. At the time, it was we couldn't do anything two hours before, two hours after. So he'd been through so much already, and I said, is this something you're interested in? I, you know, I can check and see if interns will cover. He's like, Mom, you know, this is my whole life has revolved around hospitals and emergency rooms and the allergy doctor's office, and, you know, I just, I just don't want to do it. It's one more thing. Mm -hmm. So um, most of us, well, I can't say most of us, but probably a lot of us don't just have food allergies. We have a lot of other medical conditions as well, so it's, it kind of just piles up and up and up and up. So um, that was my reason for the other. My son was tired of medical treatments and medical bills. Sure, so I mean that's, uh, I think you made an important point, one that I think maybe others have mentioned in passing but you really made directly, which is you know, this is a treatment burden that you're taking on in addition to any right. other conditions. And we've heard multiple people talk about having multiple comorbid conditions. Right. So. And he had already missed a lot of school, and I had yeah. already missed a lot of work um, and had used up a lot of my vacation time and sick time running him to the allergist office for either his monthly injection of his biologic or else his um, allergy shots. Mm -hmm. And for the other siblings, for allergy shots as well. So um, it's, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of energy, a lot of mental energy, a lot of money. Yeah. So I know this, so. this wasn't the question, but um, would... Do you think there would be a certain benefit profile that would make that burden worth it for him? Um, I think for so somebody mentioned they had done it at home. That's not something we're willing to risk. We had a one of my um, sons actually had anaphylaxis after allergy shots. We're never able to figure out what it was. So for us, that's too risky. Um, I don't know what would make it better for him. For us, it's got to be medically supervised with all the other mm -hmm. things that are going on. Okay. Um, that's well, and the other thing is, and even looking about me for seafood, when people are talking about, okay, you have your your glass of milk every day, or you have your uh, peanut butter M and M's every day to maintain it. Well, what do I do? Do I carry around a, a crab leg and a little piece of <laughs> salmon? I mean, it's just not, you know, you just can't do it. So, right. Um, it's really interesting for some things. I just, I just don't know how to fix it. I just don't know what's feasible, and how to have a better quality of life. Sure. Thank you so much. So I, we have a, a caller. Uh, this is actually another clinical trial experience, but wants to talk, uh, I think, about that experience, including some of the challenges uh, that she faced. And so that's Amelia. I uh, would like to invite her to, to share her experiences, uh, both good and, and the downsides uh, related to this clinical trial. So Amelia, are you with us? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I am Amelia. I am a mother of a 13-year-old son who was diagnosed at six months old with allergies to peanuts, all shellfish, both crustaceans and mollusks, all tree nuts, egg, milk, sweet potato, strawberries. He outgrew the milk, sweet potato, and strawberries at age three and outgrew almonds and eggs at age seven, thankfully. We live in Guntown, Mississippi, a rural area in North Mississippi, about 20 minutes from Tupelo. I became very active in the food allergy community in 2009. At that time, the common statement made by one national organization was that we were 10 years away from a cure for food allergies. This greatly increased my interest in clinical trials, and I became actively researching possible trials for my son to participate in. Over the next 10 years, the closest trial location I could find was in Little Rock, Arkansas over a seven-hour round trip for us. Fast forward to 2019, when at Fax Food Industry and Research Summit, I learned of a trial with a location in Birmingham, Alabama, which is only a five-hour round trip for us. We began the qualification and enrollment process in October of 2019. Aside from the basic cost of time and travel related to participating in the trial, 
Given the distance we had to travel and the fact that there was very little emergency care on our route to the to home after food challenges, we also had the added expense of hotel rooms on food challenge visits, given that my son had had a few delayed reactions during the oral food challenges. Additionally, we were stranded in a hotel in Birmingham for six nights due to a snowstorm and the inability to deviate from the trial schedule to reschedule the challenge, given the fact that we knew the storm was coming. As we enrolled in the trial in late 2019, just as with everything else, the trial was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the investment of both our time, our resources, our energy, and really our hope that we had already made in the clinical trial, when our schools here in North Mississippi resumed in-person classes in August of 2020, I was forced to make the difficult decision to close my private law practice, to stay home and school my son virtually, to avoid him running the risk of getting sick and being removed from the trial. Thankfully, I was still able to work for the lay organization for which I worked during this extremely difficult time, and I'm happy to say that we exited the clinical trial in May and properly began private oral immunotherapy. Unfortunately, even though Tupelo, Mississippi is the home of the largest rural health care system in the nation, no one in our area even offers the FDA-approved oral immunotherapy treatment. As such, we still travel five hours round trip to Birmingham for his OIP appointment. Our trial experience not only showed the need for better diagnostics, given the numerous food allergies, oral food challenges that he underwent. It also showed a need for better access for families in rural areas to treatment and to trials, and also more robust financial support for families participating in clinical trials. Thank you for the opportunity to share this with me. Thank you, Amelia. That was very well said, and I think you highlighted a number of you know, critical um, challenges to seeking care, whether in clinical trials or approved therapies in rural settings. So I just wanna really thank you for, for sharing that you know, really thoughtful uh, comment. Um, we have another caller. Um, you know, we uh, are actually getting a number of, of clinical trial participants today. Uh, but again, wants to share the pros and cons of clinical trial experience. That's Kelly from North Carolina, uh, who says that uh, there are pros, but also uh, cons like anxiety and burdens. Um, so, Kelly, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me okay? Uh, can you uh, say, say something else for us, Kelly? Can you hear me okay? Yes, now we can hear you uh, great. So, please. Uh, awesome. Would love to hear what you have to share. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, my story is I have eight-year-old twin boys, and one of my sons is very allergic, and we found out the hard way at seven months um, that he went into anaphylaxis in his high chair. And he, we eventually found out he has five significant food allergies and asthma on top of that. And it was life-changing. That's when it all happened for us. And we knew we were going to have a bit of a different life going forward. Um, we, we were scared. We were devastated and scared. The other twin doesn't have anything. And um, we were quite scared. And what are we going to do? How are we going to get him the right help? Um, luckily, living here in um, North Carolina, we have some great facilities, medical facilities. And um, we had to make a tough choice as a family. We were both working parents, and I actually stepped down from my job um, because I needed to get my son help, and we knew there was a chance of getting him into a clinical trial. Um, we've tried avoidance. We've avoided everything. And so it was, it was a tough decision. So it's time-consuming, yes. The scariest part for us in enrolling my son in the clinical trial was when you're signing to say, hey, um, it's worth the risk. We know things can happen, but it will be in a medical setting. And that was really hard for us, but it was the right decision. Um, the pros of this and the reason why I wanted to speak is the advancements are so important. And I can't speak about what we're seeing in the clinical trial but I want to give hope. Um, it's exciting, and we would just ask that the FDA keep considering any advancements to help kids and people with food allergies, whether it's 
novel EpiPen or whether it's other ways to help build up the body to reduce the immune response. So um, I want to give some hope in the conversation. I've been listening all day, and I just so appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, and, and thank you for sharing that hope and also for sharing you know, what really are, were, were hard decisions it sounds like you and your family uh, went through in order to uh, you know, choose, you know, to, to take on the potential benefits of participating. Emily? Well, we just heard uh, two participants in clinical trials talk about leaving their jobs in order to participate in those clinical trials. And I just want to simply highlight that that is not an option for many, many families who are looking for treatment options and deserve equitable access to treatments. And I just think that we would be remiss if we did not highlight that. And so, you know, we want to have more diverse clinical trials. And so we're gonna have to make sure that, that these emerging treatments, that we do all that we can to support families to enroll in these clinical trials that we have more funding to make sure that we break down barriers, whether it's having more clinical trial sites so that they're closer, like Amelia highlighted in her, her challenge as a, as a parent living in a rural community, but also making sure that we you know, pay people for their time. And if we're asking people to take off time from their job, I know Andrea talked about the challenges she had um, just even with allergy shots, you know, we have to think about how can we make these treatments less burdensome, and even as we're we're going along the clinical trial process to make sure they're effective, that we have the most inclusive uh, clinical trials we can, and that means we have to have funding to support an inclusive network of families. Yeah, thank you for putting a period on that, Emily. Very important. If you can just hand that right there. Um, any, uh, we'll, we'll come to Stephanie. Just want to make sure before we move on, any other treatment experiences, um, things that you know either didn't work well or treatment downsides or burdens. Um, we'll do Stephanie, and then we'll finish with uh, on this part of the, this topic with Lillian. I'd like to mention um, that my daughter has been through a clinical trial for multi-allergen OIT with Zolaire. And that was in 2014, um, started when she was eight years old. She's been in maintenance for seven years. And it, um, for us, it has been a life-changing experience. Um, and I wanted to mention, because um, that particular treatment hasn't been mentioned, multi-allergen with Zolaire. It was a shorter um, clinical trial and a shorter um, treatment. Um, and it is not yet FDA approved. So she was in phase two of the, tr of the trial, and it's been so positive for us. I hope that the FDA will consider these innovative treatments that combine um, drugs such as Zolaire, which is approved for asthma treatment, mm -hmm. but has not yet been approved for food allergy treatment, in combination to do multi-allergen OIT at the same time. She was treated for five different allergens and it reduced the, the time necessary to participate and get her to the level of maintenance. The, um, the challenges um, having a 15-year-old maintaining for seven years is really um, doing it day after day after day. So there are times when she has skipped her dose. There is one instance where she did have anaphylaxis after skipping her dose for several days in a row. Um, so really it's, it's more about maintenance and um, having an active teen who is um, in a lot of sports. When do you take your dose? Um, so thank you for letting me share. Yeah, and Stephanie, can I ask you when you, you talk about some of the, the you know, it's been life changing. You maybe be a little bit more specific. Help me understand. You know, what has this meant? Has it you know helped in terms of uh, you know accidental you know uh, contact, or has this actually allowed you know your your daughter to eat foods that she couldn't eat before? So she is cross contact safe right now. Before okay. multi allergen OIT with Zolaire, she ate at five different restaurants. Um, now she can pretty much eat at any restaurant that she wants to go to, and she knows 
that if she accidentally um, has more of her allergen than she should, um, that she will be safe mm -hmm. and that she will not have anaphylaxis. Okay. Um, it has allowed her to travel internationally by herself or with her class, which I never dreamed would be possible before this, um, before this treatment. Um, and um, able to live a more independent life without um, a parent looking on her um, constantly. Sure, thank you so much. And then we'll come to Lillian. I just wanted to share my own experience uh, with the debate of whether or not to pursue treatment. Um, I've been very lucky. I have not had a reaction since I was very little when I was first diagnosed. And that's all been because of solely food avoidance. And hearing stories like Stephanie's makes me think, wow, I would love to have that level of comfort that, you know, at least if I was exposed to cross -contaminant, through cross-contamination, that I would not have a reaction because I don't have that comfort and I still have a lot of anxiety surrounding my allergy despite not having a reaction for so many years. But there's this constant battle in my mind between should I pursue treatment because obviously I'm at an older age now where it's probably not offered for me. Also, when I was younger, I was told there wasn't anyone in the geographic location and my allergy was too severe to pursue treatment. So for me, it's been a, a, a battle even through adolescence of whether or not my mental health could take it as well as you know my physical health because in my mind, I think, well, if I've gone so long with food avoidance and haven't had anaphylaxis, why should I put myself in a scenario where I'm directly consuming my allergen and I could have, I'm much more likely in that scenario than my daily life, it seems, to have anaphylaxis. So it's just been a really hard mental health debate um, on that aspect. But yeah, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, and Lillian, um, this is kind of verging into what we're going to talk about next. But, um, you know, uh, given where you're currently at and your current you know, kind of uh, perspective on treatments, you know, what would, uh, if something were to come along, um, would be something that you would be interested in pursuing? Maybe what uh, would be a treatment goal of yours, you know, uh, if you could maybe describe that, if anything? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one of, another barrier that would definitely need to be something that changed was uh, the level of maintenance. I think I'm also concerned about pursuing a professional career. I wonder, will I mm -hmm. be able to keep that routine and make sure yes. I'm doing that where I don't miss a dose and, you know, have that uh, possible reaction. I personally would like to pursue maybe some of my less severe food allergies like chickpeas and um, soy first before mm -hmm. pursuing my main allergy. But um, yeah, I think those are my main treatment goals, but just something that would provide me with more comfort, right. um, like Stephanie was talking about, would be wonderful. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, so now we're gonna get to the, the final question for today, uh, which is really what it is that all of you, um, you know, short of the cure that we all are hoping for, um, would you be looking for in an ideal future treatment? And f to get us started on that, our final polling question of the day uh, we're going to go to that. So one last time, pull out those phones, open up that tab in your browser. Uh, we have a question for you on this. So here we're asking you which of the following outcomes would you most prefer from a future treatment? And you can select your top two. So the options are the ability to avoid a reaction due to accidental ingestion of the food allergen, also sometimes referred to as bite protection, the ability to eat small amounts without a reaction, the ability to eat products with precautionary allergen warnings, for example, when something's labeled as may contain, the ability to eat restaurant and bakery food that has cross-contact risks, the ability to eat the allergen without any restriction, uh, the, uh, you know, being able to avoid the need to carry epinephrine, or some other uh, treatment goal that you have that you would prefer um, at, from a future treatment that's not listed on this, in this question. And again, please think about this and select your top two treatment goals. And like, as you all know well, uh, we're gonna ask you why you selected what you've selected. While these results are coming in, I'll make a final uh, pitch to anyone that would wanna call in and help discuss this topic of what it is you're looking for from future treatments. You can call in at 1703-844-3231. 1703 844-3231. So I see the results are still coming in, so we'll give people just a few more moments here. So 
So as it stands, it looks like the ability to eat the allergen without any restriction would be the top preference for uh, our audience today. Uh, following that, it looks like pretty closely the ability to avoid a uh, reaction to an accidental ingestion, as well as being able to avoid the need to carry epinephrine would be uh, kind of second. And then maybe third would be the ability to eat in a restaurant or bakery food that has cross uh, contact risks. Uh, however, we also have, as it, and again, this is top two, uh, the other two response options here, as well as some people selecting something else. So we wanna hear what those are and the why. And so one last time, I'm gonna come here to our audience. This is your chance to be heard of what it is that you most per, uh, desire, prefer for you personally and your loved ones from a future treatment. Erin? Yeah, um, actually, it's none of those. Um, one of the things I'd actually really yes. like to see is better diagnostics. Okay. I mean, I think overdiagnosis is a problem that we don't talk about a lot in our community because all of us are diagnosed. Many of us have had reactions, so it's confirmed. But there are lots of people that are overdiagnosed. And, and in fact, I, I believe my son might have been one of them. He has multiple food allergies for sure. But I think initially the first three that he tested out of, he was yes. overdiagnosed with. That's a tremendous burden on patients who are living not only with the financial burden of Try, and the stress burden of trying to read labels and the education burden, but also all of the stress and anxiety that goes along with it, that burden expands not from just from the patient, but it expands out to the caregivers, to extended family, to the schools. It impacts a whole community of people that surround each patient. Yes. Um, so I think overdiagnosis and, and accurate um, diagnostics, rather, would be very helpful. It would be wonderful to see diagnostics that could predict threshold levels, um, something that each patient probably doesn't know for themselves what they are, and they vary from day to day based on your own personal um, health and, and other circumstances. But it would still be helpful guidelines for all of us, um, including it would help for labeling. If we knew our, our personal threshold, then we can understand our labeling better. Um, it would just kind of tremendously impact all of our lives. Plus, it would help get people into a healthcare pipeline who may not understand their diagnosis to begin with. Right now, diagnosis, and I applaud all the allergists out there doing it, is a lot like an art and less like a science, which is why we need oral food challenges at the present time. But something mm -hmm. to replace that would be tremendous as well. Sure. Thank you so much, Erin. Yes, Sarah. Um, so I think from the poll we saw, most people really would like to see a future without food allergies. But I hope that for the FDA listening in today, that. Um, hearing the people who have gone through OIT and have achieved the bite protection and what a life-changing moment that has been for them. I hope that that um, really comes through about the challenges of dealing every day with a food allergy, that it is life-changing just to be able to have one bite. So to be able to take all of the bites would be a miracle. Right. But it's such a burden um, that just being able to take one bite can change your life. And just to, to remind all of our listeners, can you give us a, a good example of what that one bite protection really translates to? What's a good, uh, in your experience, what, what would that be? Um, I mean, I think for most people with food allergies, every time you eat, there's a fear. Anytime you're at a restaurant, even when you're home, when you buy something new, or you know, it says, my child has a peanut allergy, it says may contain tree nuts, or there's, you know, there are recalls sometimes, you know, an allergen is not noted when it should be. And so every eating event, which happens all day, carries an anxiety. And I think that bright protection just takes some of that anxiety away. Sure, thank you so much, Sarah. Any other thoughts here? Yes, Maeve, and then we'll come. Yep. I also agree that bite protection is something that is a great next step, right? We're all looking for, for that miracle, um, but I think it's also important to consider that uh, over the last several hours and uh, over the last two days, I've been, having, uh, I've, I've been able to have a fair amount of conversations with other people with food allergies who have grown to, as a result of their food allergies, appreciate the experience that they're a part of and, and rely less so on food to provide that joy. Um, and I think that what a bite protection allows for is the continuation of, of really being a part of the life that, that you're in and enjoying the moment that you're in um, without 
without that anxiety. And I think that people with food allergies have extraordinary ability to, to be present and enjoy the moments that they do have because there is an expression of mortality that those folks and those families have to deal with on a more regular basis. And they recognize that, that life is a little bit more precious than maybe other people that do take it for granted. Um, so the ability to have a bite protection um, really just allows and encourages uh, people to take advantage of moments a little bit more as they have them. Yeah, thank you so much, Maeve. We'll come right here, and then we'll do Justin and Stephanie to finish it off. My name is Nagar, and um, I'm from Kansas City. And I have a two-year-old who is diagnosed with uh, dairy, uh, weed, eggs, and so on. And the barrier I have would be in the, uh, the ingredients I would like to see if um, they could have it in other languages because mm. it would help us tremendously, even with the EpiPen. Like I have to actually search each word to see like, what does this mean? Does it, is it suitable for my child? If it's in other languages as well, it would help um, many, many different uh, people, not just you know, people who speak English, yeah. because we do live in a society that is diverse. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I know English is the first language, but my parents doesn't know English. So I have to actually, you know, explain to them where it's just, it's, it's so conflicted, you know, mm -hmm. with everything going on. And you're saying that's just, just so I clarify what you're saying, that's both important for the treatments as well as like food labeling. Right. Yes. Well, thank you so much. You are. Very important. All right, so we'll come to Justin. <clears throat> yeah, and I'd say just a brief point as we, you know, are, are wrapping up to connect both of those around, you know, the ubiquity of food and the propensity to be scared of what might happen and recognizing that there also are often allergic reactions and anaphylaxis that happen for the first time at some point, and those people, of course, had not yet gotten a diagnosis or have an epinephrine auto injector, and so it's important that we make sure those people are protected by ensuring that there is accessible epinephrine broadly, mm -hmm. and also in other languages and in forms that are easy to, you know, use and understand and safe, because it is a, a relatively safe medication, mm -hmm. and um, we understand that early Inter, you know, early epinephrine is broadly associated with better outcomes on, on every way you look at it. And so it's, it's really important to make sure to the point about the ambulances earlier and uh, stock epinephrine in schools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, just I really want to make sure that, that that goes home. It's important to make it yeah. accessible. Um, and just to highlight the point earlier about people who don't always carry purses, it also would be nice to have it. Um, a little bit more easily incorporated into the day-to-day -day of, mm -hmm. of folks who need that need it, need it handy. Sure, and we certainly don't have the voices of those who have not yet had their first you know experience with food allergy. So thank you for sharing that perspective too, Justin. Yeah. All right, and then Stephanie. I'd love to see um, Epi be available without a needle. Uh, we talked earlier about um, hesitancy in using epinephrine. I've trained hundreds of lunch volunteers of how to use it, and I've never used it myself. Um, and my daughter has received epinephrine before, but has never used it herself. There is a moment where you are trying to think, um, is this really an allergic reaction? Do I need to use epinephrine? And as someone else uh, mentioned, you're in a in emergency response mode, and there is a little bit of fear about using an auto injector that has a needle. So um, would love to see that needle free. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Th thank you for sharing about just lowering that burden in that moment of emergency. Um, so this concludes the portion of the, the meeting where we um, are, are hearing from all of you. It's been a tremendous uh, day. Um, you know, first this morning, sharing all of your perspectives on what it is to live with food allergies and really painting, you know, a, a really detailed picture of what that looks like, not only when you are having, you know, that reaction, but in all of the anxiety uh, and, and all of the resulting downstream impacts uh, of, of needing to avoid 
um, and, and navigating life that it provides. It's, it was such an eye opener for me, and uh, you know, I, I thank you for sharing that. And then this afternoon, um, you know, uh, taking on the topic of, of treatments and helping us understand both where things are helpful. We saw in one of the polling questions, um, you know, that there is, uh, you know, some protection being provided, but we also clearly heard, uh, you know, that there's much more to be done. And so, as your meeting moderator, I just want to, you know, thank you. Uh, for, for digging, you know, deep, pulling back the curtain most of the time when we're in, in settings. You know, we're really trying to describe, you know, what works and what helps and how we persevere. And this is definitely a community that I've heard today that perseveres. Um, you know, but sometimes in order to address the, the issues that you face, we have to talk about them. And uh, I just want to commend you all for, for doing that, you know, so honestly and openly today as your moderator. So. At this point, uh, we're going to uh, move towards starting to close the meeting, but uh, as the first part of that, we're going to recap the discussion of this afternoon, and we have Tanya Winters, who's the CEO of the Allergy and Asthma Network, to do that. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, James. Today, we have been invited into the hearts and lives of so many families living with food allergy. The Food Allergy Mom Club is one that I never wished I would be a part of. The food allergy journey and struggles that we've heard today are ones that touch me in the very deepest part of my heart and my soul, not only for my daughter Carson, but for the generations to come. It is because of the stories that we've heard today, the patient journeys, the unmet needs, that I stand before you and want to recap what we've heard this afternoon and really throughout the entire day. There are significant unmet needs in food allergy. First, unmet needs in prevention. We heard from Lisa, Emily, and others about the need for better labeling. On the front of the package, with simple language, pictures, images that could be understood by people of any language. We also need better access to food as medicine. Secondly, we have unmet needs in diagnosis. Erin and Amelia spoke so eloquently about the need for diagnostic tools that have greater sensitivity and specificity in order to reduce overdiagnosis misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis in our community. Next, we have unmet needs in treatment. Don, Maeve, and others charged us with the question, what about beyond peanut? What about the community beyond the four to 17 year olds? Yes, we are so excited to have an FDA approved option for that community, but what about the rest of us? We need to target the whole person, not just the symptoms. We need a clearer regulatory path and expedited review of innovative treatments to address the unmet needs. OIT, EPIT, SLIT, toothpaste, who knows what these solutions will be, but we implore the FDA to expedite the review and the regulatory process to address them. We also have unmet needs in long-term management. We heard from Priscilla about the, the importance of anaphylaxis awareness and preparedness, but about that not being enough, that certainly we need new routes of administration for epinephrine that are affordable, that are accessible, convenient, cost efficient and remove the fear of needles that over 30% of Americans currently have. I love the question, could there be an easier way? Certainly the answer is yes. Emily charged us with addressing diversity and inclusion and the unmet needs in research and development. And as we stood here today, I could not get the words out of my head 
that no one should be forced to live in fear of more than 20 life-threatening allergic reactions like Maeve. No one should be forced to deal with the loss of a child like Elijah, like Thomas and his family deal with every single day. As a mom and an advocate in the food allergy space, I want to thank each and every patient and caregiver who has come forth today to share their story. I want to again implore the FDA to hear the cries of the unmet needs of the more than 30 million Americans who simply to desi desire to live life free of fear from food. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, so now uh, we are going to have a kind of meeting recap, meeting summary. Um, someone who is from outside of this community who's been uh, listening in throughout the day and is, is the perfect person uh, to do this, uh, which is my friend and colleague, Larry Bauer. Uh, Larry is someone that has uh, been a champion for patients for a long time. Uh, he worked for uh, uh, 17 years as a clinical research nurse at the National Institutes of Health, uh, after which he joined the Food and Drug Administration, where for 10 years he worked within the new drug review function, uh, helping to uh, expedite challenging cases and find paths forward uh, for new drugs. And for the past few years, he's been working with me to help plan and organize these meetings and has been really uh, a pillar for helping plan today's session. Uh, so I'd like to, to welcome Larry and uh, invite Larry to share his perspectives as someone from outside this community and what he heard today. Thank you so much, James. Um, so I'm just gonna give a very high level overview of what we, some of the things we heard today. Um, so it's been an incredible meeting with lots of learning, uh, on so many different levels. Um, our, the meeting today was opened by Lisa Gable, who's the CEO of the Food Allergy Research and Education Group. Uh, it was followed with the presentation from Dr. Ronald Rabin. He's from the FDA Office of Vaccines Research and Review in CBER. And Dr. Rabin shared how important these patient-focused drug development meetings are, both to the FDA and, and to the FDA review staff and that the information from this meeting is going to inform drug development and review for future treatments for, uh, for food allergies. That was followed by a clinical overview presented by Dr. Linda Herbert from Children's National Hospital. Um, she told us about the, the, how large a public health issue uh, food allergies is affecting 8% of children and 11% of adults in the United States. There are comorbidities, which often include atopic dermatitis, asthma, and environmental allergies. Um, she described how allergies are, are an immune response and affect various body systems, with the most severe manifestation being anaphylaxis. She also mentioned about the, the health care disparities that exist and that black and Hispanic kids are disproportionately affected with food allergies. And she, uh, she also, kind of, as a psychologist, she reminded us about food allergies and the big impact that they have on quality of life. Her talk was followed by the, the morning panel, which was on uh, health effects and the daily impacts of food allergies. We heard about the ongoing challenges of trying to have a normal social life and manage food allergies at the same time. Uh, we heard how limited food choices has many challenges and consequences and can even lead to poor nutrition. And some people are so sensitive that even shaking hands with someone who had touched an allergic food can trigger a reaction. Uh, childhood onset food allergies have a big impact on education and school life in kids. Some children have had to be taken out of class to go to the hospital for a reaction. And we heard about the role of school nurses in trying to manage kids that develop symptoms in school. And we heard about these different kinds of experiences and how traumatizing they are to children. Transitioning to becoming a teenager has its own issues. And kids have to become more self-reliant and learn how to manage their own food allergies independently. 
Teenagers also have a certain amount of peer pressure that they have to juggle with managing their allergies. And this transition period can be very anxiety provoking for parents. Anxiety in general is common for both kids and parents. People fear taking the wrong bite of food at a restaurant or a friend's house. And potentially fatal anaphylactic reactions are an ongoing fear and can happen even when people are making the best efforts to remain safe. So after the first panel, we had a wonderful recap of the morning by Eleanor Guerra Holding, who's the CEO of the Food Allergy Anaphylaxis Connection Team. Uh, we moved into the afternoon where we heard perspectives on allergy treatments. Uh, we heard that food avoidance, of course, is the number one treatment for food allergies, but it has many issues and problems, including accurate food labeling. Most everyone said they would like to see treatment options beyond just food avoidance. Another point came up that allergy-free foods tend to be much more expensive than uh, regular foods. And people said they would like to see safe, FDA-approved early interventions for allergies. Patients are often taking several different treatments, and some of these have side effects like drowsiness that are caused by the drugs. We heard about steroid use. Um, there are, steroids are often used for treatment but need to be monitored for side effects, especially in young kids. And one mom stated it feels like you're on a constant tightrope with medication. Many people have had help with oral immunotherapy, or OIT, especially for peanut allergies. Then we had a long discussion about EpiPens, which can be very effective, but it's challenging to know when to use them, and there are also fears around using them. How do parents determine when an episode rises to needing an injection? And kids can have needle phobia and bad experiences when they've had to have these injections at early ages. Storage of the drug can be an issue as well. And people have expressed that they would like to see less invasive treatments for anaphylaxis. Regarding research, people ask that there be increased representation of people of color in clinical trials. And everyone across the board wants to see more and better treatment options. The afternoon was just recap. We just heard from Tanya Winders, who's the CEO of the Allergy and Asthma Network. And we've heard consistently there continues to be a great unmet need for people living with food allergies. People would like more safe and effective treatments and better alternatives to just food avoidance and EpiPens. And I just wanted to add that as a consultant helping to plan this meeting, I really want to commend the various food allergy advocacy organizations and their incredible spirit of cooperation to come together to plan this meeting with the goal, everybody on the same page, to help people living with food allergies. It's been great working with you all. And now at this point, I'd like to return back to the meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Larry, for that uh, comprehensive uh, summary. Um, I, it's probably one of the hardest jobs of the day, trying to recap so many voices that we heard. And now finally, to close the meeting, I'd like to invite up Kenny Mendez, the CEO of the Asthma, Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Thanks, James. <clears throat> Um, well, uh, this has been an incredible day, and I want to say uh, thank you to James for hosting. Uh, you've done an incredible job, and let's give you a round of applause there and your team. And uh, thank you to the PFDD team. Uh, Anita, I remember when we were first dreaming about this two years ago or, or less. I can't remember with COVID now how long it's been. And then I also want to thank my team at AFA, uh, looking at the camera wherever they are. I pulled the plug on them attending in person. Uh, because of uh, COVID and the Delta variant, but I hope they can see the fruits of all their hard work here and, and what we've done together as a group. And then I want to thank you, the panelists, for sharing your stories. Um, it brings me back in terms of my personal uh, story. I'm, I'm not an allergy mom. I'm an allergy dad, and my wife has been the caregiver pri primarily, but um, uh, my personal story is that two of my three sons have had uh, severe food allergies and asthma. And uh, my youngest, Theo, by the time he was two years old, he had been in the emergency room twice with anaphylaxis. Um, luckily, uh, he, had, he couldn't eat beef, dairy, eggs, nuts, um, but luckily he outgrew them by the time he was five. Um, but, but Maeve, uh, your story about being a uh, exercise-induced anaphylaxis 
Theo was a competitive athlete in college and uh, he would have severe sneezing bouts after a competitive match and the doctors diagnosed that it was uh, exercise-induced anaphylaxis. So just hearing these stories was comforting to know that there are others out there who are experiencing this. So thank you for that. Um, his older brother, Will, still has peanut allergies, lives in New York City, and, and um, they're all in their 20s now, but I know some of you have had have children in their 20s. Uh, Justin, you look like you're in that, you're that age group now, too, and others. But what I wonder about, it's been 27 years, and what's it going to be like when my kids are parents? Um, it, as I look back on my personal experience and hear your experience, it's been 27 years and there have been some advancements, but not enough and not quickly enough. For us to hear all the things we heard today about fear of eating out and the anxiety, that shouldn't be here for that long. I would have hoped when my kids were little that later on this would change. And, and hearing from all of you that you're still in that situation now is, is troubling, although per what Kelly said on the line, I think there's hope. There's clinical trials, there are other things, and that's where, what it leads into here with the, with the FDA and, and what I hope the FDA takes away from this. And apologies for being repetitive, but I think it is really true. I think we need more ready access to epinephrine alternatives. I mean, it's quite expensive, but immediately, right now, we need those alternatives. There have been shortages, there have been other issues that we deal with, and I think it's really important for that rescue medication right away. And then the technology alternatives, so no needles and other, other alternatives. I think getting those to market more quickly would be really helpful for our community. And then on an on ongoing basis, better labeling so we can manage. So if we decide that we want to pursue avoidance, if that's what it is for us, then let's get better labeling out there. And we've all worked together as a group here with the F Food Allergy Collaborative to get better labeling. And we luckily have sesame now listed as the ninth allergen or soon, soon to be thanks to the work of us in this room. And then new therapies to give peace of mind for accidental exposure. There's one out there now. There are others that are not FDA approved, but we've heard that. And that's really important that the FDA take away from this in terms of drug development and other therapy development. And then, then again, echoing the, the better diagnostics. I think that that's really important for all of us here. And so if the FDA can take away those messages, many of us have said that. But if I'm closing here, in addition to thanking everyone who put this together, I would just hope the folks at the FDA really take this to heart because it has been, in my own experience, 27 years, and we need to make faster progress. We've seen progress with COVID-19, vaccinations, and other things in recent times. Let's do the same thing for uh, food allergies. So thank you.